Big Sis. You know, I was just telling Tone. This is the best time of the year for sports talk. Anybody can talk sports during the football season. Slam dunk. Now, you find out who the entertainers are and who sparks your interest. I've always had the highest ratings in the offseason. I was just telling Tone this. Not really during the football season. You know, I, I have a certain bunch of folks that have followed me around for 30 years. And they know this. There's never a boring time or there's never a layup show. We don't do that here. What to talk about. Okay? Always. And especially with today's football. Now, now look, I'm not going to bore you with NBA and with NHL talk or baseball talk. Baseball, really, 20 games in? I will go there a little bit like we always do. Basketball, wake me up in June. Wake me up in June. Players don't give a shit about it. Why should I? You got to put rules into their game to make them want to play. If you have to put a rule like that in your game, you need to do something for me as a fan. In-game tournament? Man, I don't know. Not quite selling it. You know what I'm saying? They're trying to spark your interest. The NFL keeps your interest. You know, I learned a lesson from you guys a long time ago. You know one thing, Tone, that I've learned from talking on YouTube versus talking on the radio? People who still do a format on radio think because the season changes, you have to talk about that respected sport in that season. Why would you do that when you just saw 202 million people viewed and watched an NFL game on a platform or such when you know those other sports give you nothing? They absolutely give you no context when it comes to numbers. It's like walking into your favorite restaurant Your favorite dish has been taken off the plate, and they tell you it's seasonal. Okay? Unfortunately, we have to start the show off with that sad situation in Kansas City. You know what I just despise something like this? Is that it becomes immediately political. Man, eight kids were shot. DJ lost her life, who was the mother to one of the kids that was shot. 800 cops were on hand. Okay? That couldn't have been stopped. That could not have been stopped. We have maniacs in our society today. You know, and, and, and believe me, I'm not here to make a political statement. Guns don't kill people, do. Maniacs do. Put more hoops in and getting a gun? Sure, I'm all for it. But the political talk has to be put aside. When a community was sitting there and celebrating what was to be a great day in Kansas City. You've ever been to Kansas City? It's a great place. Bobby Bell's old barbecue place, man. If you went there and you had Bobby Bell's barbecue, Bobby Bell is a dear friend of mine. And man, I love that man. He was such a legend. One of the greatest barbecue places of all time. Used to come on my show all the time during the Super Bowl. I posted numerous pictures of me and him. Damn. Nothing could have stopped that maniac or those maniacs. And by the way, man, how about that crowd? You know what? I, you know, I almost said something completely stupid like I would. Let me tell you something. You try some shit like that in Broad Street during an Eagle Parade. I don't think the cops get there. <laughs> I, hey, it's just me. The first thing I thought about, and I'm not saying, hey, I'm not saying those people were heroes. But I'm not thinking that dude is, there's much left to that dude during an Eagle Parade. I was like, man, kudos to those Kansas City Chief fans who tackled that asshole and put that guy down for the cops to come over and get him. Really awesome, man. Those people were heroes. Those cops were heroes, too. 
Unfortunately, we have maniacs in our society. It's just absolutely bullshit that you feel because you're such a loser that you've got to impede on people's freedoms. Hey, I'll say this to you too. Do I think, and I heard Rob say this earlier, I'm probably going to do away with these parades. You know why? Because get this, if you have 900 cops or 800 cops, there's nothing you can do to stop that. I mean, a military presence, they basically almost had a military presence and they still couldn't stop it. So you're going to have to, because there's some weirdo people in the world just like we put fences up around schools now, we're going to have to hold these things in stadiums or in a secure location so everyone, when they walk in, because our society has these maniacs in it, we're going to have to protect everybody because we got to protect our fans. We got to protect the people that love the Chiefs, the Eagles, the Bills, whoever your favorite team is. Okay? I mean, personally, <laughs> those are the kind of people that deserve the electric chair. Okay. That's the kind of person you drop through a trap door with a rope around his neck. Shooting kids. Hey, I'll tell you this. Hurting animals, the elderly or children, you get dropped through a big sales trap door for that. And those people that tackled that guy, you get the medal of honor, man. Need more people like that in our society looking out for one another. That's good shit, man. That's good stuff. You took it upon yourselves to take that guy down. You weren't going to sit around and be a victim. Dude, that's how you do it. Guys like that, like I said, you got these guys in custody. I dropped those people through a Hassan. I, I mean, I just put that guy through a trap door. And that guy's got a rope around his neck. Shooting kids at a parade for the Kansas City Chiefs and seeing their favorite stars. And you can't do that in America today? Man. God bless the United States of America, man. Make sure you protect us from those kind of people. I just, I, I just, I don't get it. Okay. Hey, you want to off yourself? Go in a corner, do your own deal. That's your account. It's on you. But don't shoot kids. What's up with that? You know, I I I rarely tell the story. My 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 preacher just um he just retired. Monsignor Monsignor Father Bob. Monsignor Weiss. And Monsignor Weiss is a very dear friend of mine. He's been my priest since I was in high school. And Monsignor Weiss was the man who had to inform the families at Sandy Hook and in Newtown. He married my wife and I. And he had to inform those families, half the families, that their children were massacred. Had to take a year or two off because it was a mental strain on him. And, you know, something like that, you'll never forget. So, crazy. God bless these people, man. You know, we're, we're going to have to start holding these things in stadiums. All right. Enough of that. Um, I wrote down... My priorities. And I'm going to put these things in order here on how in what in a priority that the Eagles have to address organizationally, player-wise, scheme-wise. I've written down, let me see here. As a matter of fact, just so you know, guys, I mean, I come loaded every day, okay? Where's that sheet with all those on there? Here they are here. I've got about 12 items that we're going to go over here. The top priorities for the Eagles this offseason. What do you think? And again, I'm going to go 1 through 12, and you tell me, if these are the priorities that could fix this team and make this football team 
a football contender to get back to a Super Bowl. You ready? Okay. Number one. You got to figure out what to do with the Reddick deal. Now, I, I'm not going to debate it because we have the last couple days. But you have to figure out what you want to do with it. Do you really think the Eagles want him back? If you want a player that bad, you sign him. You do everything as a priority to sign the guy. You don't give the guy. It's like this. Hey, guess what? I know you're under contract. But go ahead, take a look, see what you can find. If you really want a guy that bad, like, how about this? You think the Kansas City Chiefs would ever do this to Patrick Mahomes? Hey, hey I know you love us, man. But if you want to see what else is out there, how much of a priority is Hassan Reddick to the team coming back? Dude, $25 million, you can forget that. I think the Eagles got ahead of that $20 million conversation. I don't think they've even had that conversation because they don't want to have it. They liked, I think they liked the player. Remember I told you? I think you fall in like with your guy. And you know what that means? I fall in like with that guy. 15 million reasons I fall in like with him. Anything over that and not restructuring the deal, in my opinion, it's wasted resources. And I'm not sure I want you back. Do you think, really, that that is a priority of the Eagles wanting him back? Or do you think it's more about addressing the guy and what his deal is and what it would mean to the football team? you got to be aggressive, as we said yesterday here. You might have to make some tough cuts to get ahead. Hey, getting rid of and trading Hassan Reddick a step back to take two steps forward in three years from now? I don't know. The, the Kansas City Chiefs are doing that right in front of your eyes, and they won a Super Bowl in the middle of a rebuild. Yes, 15 helps. But then you got to determine whether or not your guy's the guy. Anthony Gosills Reddick is underpaid. Absolutely no way. He's a one-trick pony. I say that all the time. He's a liability. If that guy doesn't get sacks, he's a liability. End of story. Here's number two. The top priorities for the Eagles this offseason. You got to restructure both those corner deals. Or you're going to be in purgatory for two years. You've got underachieving players with overmaxed contracts. That has to be priority number two. Reddick's deal and those corners deals. Has to be. d Macklin, the son were sacrificed for our Super Bowl. Tough decisions can lead to great results. That's exactly right. That's where I'm going here. Okay? That's what I'm doing here. Priority number two has to be a restructure of both corners deals. You have to address the Reddit contract. Priority number three. Hey, senor, are you in here? What to do with DeAndre Swift? What do you do with Swift? These are the top Eagle priorities. Senor, you in here? I said something the other day. We got into a back and forth here. And he said this, Sills. Was it you, Senor, that said that, hey, the Eagles will bring Swift back? I said you were... Nuts, right? I think I told you that. I looked at the top 25 free agents that CBS Sports has put out, and DeAndre Swift's name is not on that list. Then I turned around and I looked at what PFF had DeAndre Swift in the running back classification, and he's sixth. Um. 
Do you bring him back? Is there a market for him? You think there's a mark? You think he's going to get more than four million? Is that floating around the number you'd be comfortable with? You might be right, dude. The market may dictate, hey, the grass ain't greener on the other side, brother. Okay? I mean, it, Cali Green, right? If the price is, is four million enough to bring that back. Or do you want to get down to TJ Edwards category again and try to re try to repeat finding a guy like that? Get a power back in the draft to help the power game? Better blocking running back in the draft? It's always a challenge for rookies coming into the league when it comes to blitz pickup. I mean, would you sign DeAndre Swift for four million? I don't think he's going to get five or six. Like, get this. I don't think he's going to get a Miles Sanders deal. You think somebody's going to pay him six and a half? Hmm. Again, you know what he's done? The same thing. You know what teams are going to look at? Well, look at that offense he played in. Miles Sanders was a one-year wonder. Is Swift? How do you know Swift's not a one-year wonder? He's never done this before. I think that's a priority. What are you going to do with DeAndre Swift? Are you going to pay him? Or are you going to let him walk? Eight million? What running back in the open market last year got eight million dollars that wasn't already on a team? Barkley got money because he was with the Giants. And Jacobs got some dough because he was with the Raiders. Name me one running back that got eight million dollars in the open market. Nobody's getting $8 million. That's not the market value. Nobody is. You know, I'd be actually... Sh Barkley? How, is Barkley going to get $9 million from a team who has been injured over the last four years? Would you pay, would you pay Saquon Barkley $10 million? I would never pay that for him. $10 million bucks? For what? Last three, three of the last four years, he's been injured. He's an older player. 10 million bucks? I'm not paying that. 9 million? I'm still not paying that. I'm putting my money in my O line and in my secondary before I'm putting it in a running back. The commanders? Dude, they got to figure out who the QB is. I can't be figuring out Saquon Barkley or Josh Jacobs. So DeAndre Swift, because of the market, may be an eagle. Guys may not be wrong on this one. Okay? okay he's, Barkley's 27, and he's been hurt three of the last four years. 10 million bucks? Okay, let's take a look at that, for instance. How many running backs have made big money that have led their football teams in the last six Super Bowls? Who are the big backs that have led their teams to Super Bowls? Well, it ain't Pacheco. Um, I, I, who, who was the running back when they won the Super Bowl in Los Angeles? Akers? Was that the kid's name? Was it Akers? The guy with the Bucks, Leonard Fournette? I'm not sure he had a thousand bu a thousand yards. Plus, they didn't pay him because he got cut from Jacksonville. Um. Prior to that, Kansas City. I don't remember who the back was in Kansas City when they won the first Super Bowl. The big time running backs are not a premium to build your you don't build your team around a guy. You spend 10 million dollars on a guy and he's a running back, that means you're building your team around him. No team builds what team in the NFL today builds their football team 
Even Tennessee got away from that. What team builds their team around a running back? Can you name me one? Jamal Anderson? Shit, that's back in the 90s. I mean, is there a team in the league that Christian McCaffrey, but he does all, he does so much. So Flexen says the Browns. You think the Browns build their football team around a $230 million guaranteed quarterback? They build their team around the running back. When they gave a quarterback a quarter of a billion dollars in guaranteed cash, and you think they build their team around a running back? They may have the philosophy of a running game, but they build that team around the QB. Remember, follow the money, man. Don't be talking about a running back in, in Cleveland when you got a guy making $230 million in guaranteed cash. They tr trust Chubb more? Hey, that's your opinion. Facts are they pay that quarterback $230. Okay, they trust him more? Oh, hey, I love you more than him, but I'm going to pay him seven times more than you. You'd slap a guy in the face for telling you that, wouldn't you? Hey, I really, what do you like, coaches talk? Hey, I love you. We lean on you more, okay? But I'm paying him seven times more than you. But we lean on you more. That's how you lose a player, by lying to his face like that. Priority number four. So, my top three priorities. Hassan Reddick deal. Restructuring both your corners. What to do with DeAndre Swift? Number four, Kelsey. Um, are you really ready for the change if you move on from him? Are you ready? Are you ready for the change? you got a brand new coordinator coming in. You struggled with interior blitzing. And you want to break in a new center and a new coordinator? And basically a new play caller with a new center? Is that what you want to do? Are you sure you're ready for that? It's one thing if Jalen Hurts was the second runner-up to the MVP this year, and he had the 22 year he had in 23. And you, you want to go there, and you, he was great against the Blitz. It's another thing to sit here and go, so you're going to change out the best center in the sport who understands blitz pickup, and you had the best center in the sport, and you still struggled, and you're going to put a lesser player in there. Really? That's your plan. I hear people saying this, actually. Hey, I want to take that money and allocate it somewhere else. Dude, the money that Jason Kelsey makes, you're looking at it wrong. The experience that Jason Kelsey brings, along with his ability, he's a $20 million a year guy. Jason Kelsey's under value. Let me say this to you. If he was 27 years old, he'd make $20 million. The only reason he's not making more is because he's older and he's at the end. I have seen very few guys that have been great like that until they just say, hey, you know, I don't want to do it anymore. Very few. I mean, he's one of these guys. He, I mean, Kevin Mawai didn't play this well at the end, and he's a Hall of Famer too. NG goes, he's as old as dust. I don't care how old he is. He's still the best guy in the sport. It's only a one-year deal. This is not a multiple cap hit. So you want to really bring in a new guy. Get, get this. So you want to right now take the best center, the most knowledgeable center, out of your offensive line. And by the way, Jason Kelsey, out of your offensive line, and then Isaac Sayamalo from a year ago out of your offensive line. And you have Landon and Malata and Lane. Are you still a top 10 O-line? 
Probably. But you're weak as hell in the middle. Especially on the right side. And right there with the quarterback. If I'm a coordinator, I'm blitzing, I'm, I'm, I'm blitzing right up the A-gap. I'm going to bring perimeter pressure, and I'm going to bring A-gap. I'm going to test Steen Jurgens out every game. And I'm going to wear them out. You think you're blocking the 49ers interior with Jurgens and Steen versus Jurgens and Kelsey and Landon? I think you're asking for an awful lot. You're asking for an awful lot. I'm telling you, putting Cam Jurgens in the middle would be a poor decision as putting N'Kobe Dean back in as Mike Linebacker. You know the things he has to know, the blitz pickups, the sliding of the front, setting the blocking scheme, all of that. The tush push is gone. You want to take all that away from your offense? I don't get that. Me, personally, I think it's an easy decision. That's right. Flexing, I think that'd be a horror show getting rid of him. Ten million bucks? Shit, he's underpaid. Hey, get this. Jason Kelsey's underpaid. And you think 10 million's too much for him? He's underpaid. You got more value with him. Knowledge and skill. How many times can you match that up? Knowledge and skill. I'm not getting rid of that. I'm just not. I'm not, I'm not. How about this? I'm not ready to move off that. Number five, top priorities for the Eagles in the offseason. What to do with Fletcher Cox? Fletch, love you. I think you could make $15 million in the open market. That's too rich for us. If you want to take a look around in the free agent market, know this, you got a home here at a reasonable and negotiable price. I'm not pushing you out. We'd love to have you, but that's a little too rich for us. Okay, it's a little too rich for us. No, 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 I'm not saying see you, but if it's 10 million, I'm saying good luck to you. I don't really want to get the player out of the building, but things have to be negotiated here. You know, I need the money. I want the player still. Okay? Just like I say this to you. See? I, 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 I don't have Brandon Graham as a priority here. Because I don't think he's a priority. I think it's a foregone conclusion. He's out. And this... I, here's this. His roster spot. You want to give him $50 million? For a ceremonial parade? To go around all the NFL? I don't, I'll, I'll, sure, okay. I would really not have a problem with that. But at the end of the day, I want his roster seat. He's just not good enough. And, and get this. No disrespect. We'll give you the greatest press conference, greatest conversation you've ever had in your life. You're an eagle for life. We love you very much. Thank you for your service, sir. You'll get your jacket in a couple of years. You'll be a priority here forever but it's not happening. Be honest with the player. Hey, why don't you do me a favor? Okay. Why don't you just do me a favor? You know, just be honest with somebody for once. Cox played better than Kelsey. I don't remember uh, Fletcher Cox being named to the all pro team. I must've missed that one. And I don't think Fletcher played better than Jason Kelsey. I think you're. I think he had a really good year on a really shitty defense. And and Barb, when you play the way you play at the end of the year as a unit, you all suck. One in seven, down the stretch, and you're singling that he played better than Jason Kelsey. I don't know how you tie that in. 
when they were dominated against the run almost by every single team in the second half of the season. Not true. They were run on, they were passed on, and they were scored on. So he was the best of the worst. I did put Brandon Graham here, not coming back. And I want to make that clear early. You see, I I, I heard Tone say something. And and he'll be on at 3.30. By the way, he'll be on at 3.30. And Jason Cole, again, will be on at 4.30. We'll talk Super Bowl with him and why Eric Allen didn't make the Hall of Fame. If I had a choice bringing Kelsey or Cox. And BG, there's no debate of conversation, right? Get this. I heard Tone say something. Championship teams are built in the offseason, not during the season. Your championship team is being negotiated by all parts now. What you do now will determine whether or not you're a contender or not in the fall. So you don't have a lot of time. And you have to make quick decisions here. It's not like you, it's not early in the process. Because things change. Players resign. Bad interviews. The money's not right. You've got to have a plan. And you've got to have a business plan. What you do now will reflect how you play in September because these will be the pieces you're going to go to war with in the fall. What happened when Howie tried to retool the team with the linebackers in season? It was a disaster. You, 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 you got lucky the year before with Linville Joseph. You know why? You had Javon Hardgrave. That year, his last year in Philly, had 11 sacks. Brandy Graham. Son, you're out. Top Eagle priorities in the offseason. One was Reddick's deal. Two, restructuring both corners. What to do with DeAndre Swift? Kelsey? By the way, Kelsey usually gives us an answer around the combines. So when they go into the combines, they kind of know what they're doing. So we'll probably hear that decision. So that will give me a little bit more time. So he's probably going to give that decision. But I got to be prepared, whatever it is. Don't get caught with your pants down here. What to do with Fletcher Cox at five? Informing Brandon Graham he's not coming back. Number seven. Who and what is Nolan Smith? Who is he? What is he? What is he? What is this? All I see is athleticism. Athleticism doesn't translate into football player. Uh, You you get confused. Just because you're a tremendous athlete doesn't mean you're a tremendous ball player. That's like saying the strongest guy in the gym is the best football player. That doesn't necessarily mean that. What what is Nolan Smith? Who is Nolan Smith? How are you going to use Nolan Smith? What's the plan for him? Is there a plan? Tone said something two months ago, or maybe it was two weeks ago, Days get crossed over with me. He went like this. I felt they just threw him out there. And I said this, that ain't coaching and developing then. That's a necessity. And you had to do it because you had no choice to put him out there, which means you didn't want to put him out there. Okay, well, what is he? And this notion, well, it was his first year. Shit, he showed no signs of being productive. He showed no signs of being productive or being put in a position to be productive. How are you going to use him? What's his position? Is he an edge? Is he an 
an outside linebacker? What, what, what exactly is his role? I don't think they know what to do with him. That's the problem they have with Nolan Smith. Who is he? Number eight, free agent safety, free agent corner, or free agent linebacker? What are you going to use in free agency? You can't address them all because you don't have money. Are you going to go safety? Well, that's money that I don't want to spend because if I have to get a quality safety, I'm going to have to spend money. So I'm probably going to go into draft there. A corner? That's going to cost me some big money, especially if we're talking about the guy in Denver or the guy in Chicago. Those guys are all young, very expensive. Probably draft. So that leaves linebacker. Are you going to go get a Willie Gay Jr. from Kansas City and offer him a contract at $7 million? I think that's your target. Me, if you're going to change your game a little, you might want to go into free agency and spend some money when it comes to the linebacker position. I'm not talking about a king's ransom here. I personally don't think $7 million is a lot for a lockdown middle linebacker who could just help your defense overnight. I'll tell you this. Sertan can help your defense overnight in a second and turn it into a top 15 unit. Gay Jr. could probably solidify your run defense, and you guys could really stop, stop the wall from uh, water leaking. This guy could stop the leaking if you hired somebody like that. Patrick Queen, you're not. Okay? Patrick Queen is out of your price range. You got to worry about the money. You don't have, again, if you're able to restructure and trade Reddick, you could probably clear up $30 million. On top of the 20 you have, that's 50. 18 of that money, remember, goes to the draft, and the rest you can go to battle with in free agency. That's why the priority, the top priorities are the corners and Reddick's deal. That's where you're going to get your that's where you're going to get your latitude in spending your cap. Number 9. What are you going to do with wide receiver 3? What's your game plan there in the offseason? What what what's your game plan? All these really good football teams that we watched in the postseason, the kid Jennings in San Francisco is a non-factor. And he was the best player when it came to the wide receivers the Niners had. And they were trying to find other ways, getting other people open. And that kid Jennings had a great game. Some of these quarterbacks and these coordinators They spread the ball out way more than Philly. You're in a tight box, it seems. If it's not Devontae, get this. If I'm a coordinator, 33% of Jalen Hurts' throws are going to three dudes. 33 for AJ, 33 for Devontae, and potentially 33 for Goddard. Those are the only guys they go to. So if I'm coordinating against you, it's situationally, you kind of tip your hand to me. You don't spread the ball out at all. I mean, I watched Jordan Love spread the ball. Jordan Love. I watched C.J. Stroud spread the ball around. Guys, we're going to nobodies. You go to the same three people, and most notably the same two people, every game. And sometimes you go to one guy. You, you you narrow the game and you make it harder on Jalen. Personally, I think the fact that you don't have anything at that wide receiver three, I think that's one of the reasons he had high turnovers. If you're going to throw the ball more, you got to spread the ball out more. 
you know, you don't isolate yourself in a sandbox with two dudes. Doesn't that make sense? You become predictable as hell like that. If you're going to throw the ball around more, you've got to spread it out more. That doesn't go on in Philly. It just doesn't go on in Philly. You got two dudes they go to. You want to throw the ball more, but isolate two people. It just doesn't make sense. And 2023, Hertz's attempts went to A.J. Brown at Devontae alone. 50%. Think about this. 50% of, of, I mean, holy cow. No wonder the guy had high turnovers. You were telegraphing it before the snap. Hertz's turnovers will dramatically come down if you do something at wide receiver three. And that's the math. Yeah, right. See, that's right, Tone. That's the math. That's not an opinion. So if I'm a coordinator, and I know you're going to two dudes, and most notably one dude, how did the Eagles throw the ball more and spread it out less? Doesn't that telegraph where you're going? That's why you had guys on their couch going, well, it's going here. Because they weren't going anywhere else. I'm curious, just off the top. How many catches total came out of that number three position this year? How many total catches of Jalen Hurts is, what was it? Did he throw the ball, what was it, 500 times? Five-something? What was it, 538 or something like that he threw the ball? Of Jalen Hurts' passes that he had, how many catches did the wide receiver number three have of those 500-plus passes that he threw this year? I can't think that total's high. And I can't think the touchdown output is high. You, 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 all you have to do is look at the trends of how they approach a game last year. I think that's going to be dramatically different. I really do. Under 100? Man, under 100? I, 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 you think it's that high? It's near 100? I don't know. I might be wrong. Okay? I, I, I might be wrong there. 100 catches, you think, there? I'm awake, are you? Like around there? Two to Jones, one to Oz. So three touchdowns you got out of that position. Okay? Just saying. You got to figure out what you're going to do at wide receiver number three. Got gotcha, you, brother. Now, here's something else you're going to have to take a look at. Hurts 352 completions. Brown and Smith 183. They had 183 uh, completions of those 352. And 2023 on 11% of Jalen Hurts' attempts went to Olamide. Quez and Julio Jones combined. Together, those three wide receivers accounted for 60 targets and 36 catches. You guys thought it was near 100? Those three dudes had 36 catches. Of Jalen Hurts is over 500 attempts. 36 catches. With those three players and three touchdowns. I mean... <laughs> If I'm a coordinator, I don't have to coordinate that. Common sense tells me, well, they're not going anywhere else. They're not going anywhere else. And this is why, get this, that's less than one catch per game for each individual. How about this too? And hey, and this is what makes Goddard's missing a ball games matter. When Goddard misses ball games, you're at a bigger deficit. Because you're not getting anything out of WR3 and you're getting nothing out of the tight end position. So in theory, when Goddard's injured and he's not out there, you're playing with nine guys. Yeah, you, hey, Anthony, you could say bad play calling all you want. 
you're playing with nine dudes. You get nothing out of the tight end position in the passing game. You really get no, kind of maybe something a little out of the run game. Well, it didn't help in the second half of the season because Goddard was banged up again. I mean, you know, Walker brings a great point up. He says, you got to remember who the play caller is. Well, where's Jalen Hurts saying, I'm not calling that play? Shit, Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid gives him total autonomy in the middle of a ball game to change plays. He goes off script. Shouldn't Jalen be given that autonomy too? Hey, if he's your guy, shouldn't he be given that autonomy? Or are you still holding him in a box? Sure seems it. Isolate him from the players, or excuse me, the media. You're telling him where to throw the ball. He throws to two people. When Goddard's injured, it's even more of a problem. Dude, Jalen Hurts' interceptions became a problem because teams knew exactly what you were doing. And it was to a point where, get this, it wasn't an opinion anymore. It became a fact because they were looking at the trends. Two dudes got all the balls. Your number three wide receiver had 36 catches with three dudes and three touchdowns. Man, I, I see Patrick Mahomes sometimes, or even Jordan Love. These guys go to 10 different guys. Just makes them, it just, you've got to figure that out. Here's something else, number 10. Top Eagle priorities. Number one is the Reddick deal. Two, restructuring the contracts. Three, what to do with Swift. Kelsey, convincing him to come back. Five, telling Fletcher he can test the open market. Six, informing Brandon Graham he's not going to be back with the Eagles in 2024. Seven, what and who is Nolan Smith? What are you doing with him? Eight, you're going to spend money on safety, corner, or linebacker. If you notice, those are all positions you blow at when it comes to drafting. Better hit on it. Number nine, what do you do with wide receiver three as we just talked about? Okay. Number 10, what's the identity going to be of the offense? You're going to formulate that in OTAs and in minicamp, okay? You got to figure out who you are. You didn't all year. There was no identity on that football team offensively. In 22, Brown and Smith accounted for 61% of the Hurts targets. The main difference between 22 and 23 is the league caught up with what the Eagles were doing and they did nothing to adjust. And also, you had 25 touchdowns and over 2,000 rushing yards between Miles Sanders and um, Jalen Hurts. That also offset that because it's made you dual threat. Those guys got all the targets and Jalen Hurts and Miles Sanders carried the mail when it came to the running of the football and red zone, you had 25, 24 touchdowns between Sanders and Hertz and 22 and over 2000 rushing yards. This year you were 500 yards shy and Jalen Hertz had to carry the majority of the weight when it came to rushing touchdowns because DeAndre Swift brought you nothing when it came to red zone touchdowns. Okay. I mean, last year, you were more of a dynamic power team, and you scored in the running game. And you were balanced in the running game. This year, you were not balanced in the running game because they took Hurts out of the running game to some extent. You, 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 your running game hurt your passing game and became more predictable in your routes because they knew Hurts wasn't going to be the threat. You understand you took the one dynamic out of your team. A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith are not the dynamic in your offense. It's Hurts on third down. 
What's he going to do? Oh, now I know. He's going to A.J. Brown or he's going to Devontae Smith. Don't you think coaches and players, they have these conversations, but he's not running it like that anymore. It wasn't that they figured the routes out. They figured the Eagles didn't want to run them anymore. You watch him on film. He gets down. He slides. They're not really designing those plays. They figured out the counter trade play. How many people were waiting for him this time when he kept the ball and he was going to go back door? And they got him because the end didn't do what? The year previous in 22, you know what the end did? He didn't get as deep as the ball, which you're supposed to do. In 22, they went into pursuit. Well, this year they were waiting for him. And they couldn't get that playoff. Teams, dude, you've got coaches that just do this, that are sitting here and watching the Eagle game film every play for the last two years, and they dissect it. They come up with trends, your best 22 plays, your best 25 plays, how you script your plays, what do you do in third and long, how do you look when you come out of the half. All of that is dissected by coordinators in the league today. Okay? What's your identity going to be? What's Kellen Moore want to accomplish? I don't know. How about this? Let me ask you guys a favor. What was Kellen Moore's identity as an offensive coordinator in Dallas? Can you tell me? Maybe that'll help us a little bit in what to be prepared for in 24 here. What was Cowboy's identity when he was the OC there? What what what, what did they want to do offensively? Throw the ball 50 times? If Jalen Hurts gets into a position where he's throwing the ball 50 times, he'll look like Lamar Jackson going home in a playoff game. I want Jalen Hurts to throw the ball 50 times if I'm a coordinator because he's not beating me. Shit, man. That's for any quarterback, except for 15. Okay, except for 15. Josh Allen throws the ball 50 times. He's getting beat too. He's getting beat because there's no balance. So tell me, what's his identity? Can you tell me? What his identity is? What's he want to accomplish? Play action, move the pocket, throw on the run is what Dak was doing. I actually like that. If you want to get him into a position where you want to have him look like a young Aaron Rodgers, and you know why? Why is that important? And why is that a good take by Kyrie? Why is that a good take? Kyrie. Play action, move the pocket, throw on the run. That's what Dak was doing. Why is that a great way to teach Jalen Hurts? I like that. Kyrie, you know why? You roll Jalen Hurts right, move him on the hash, got the hash in the sidelines. He gets a chance to learn how to read defenses with half the field instead of the whole field. He struggles throwing across the middle of the field. Move the field. That's a great take, Kyrie. If Jalen has issues, or how about this? The Eagles feel he has issues. And throwing to the center of the field, move the field. You know, I heard Pete Rose say something years ago when it came to batters that struggle at the plate. He said, don't change your stance. The stance and your batting swing is what got you to the big leagues. Move in the box, move up, move back. If you're struggling with uh, change-ups, move up. If you're struggling with the curve, move back. If you're struggling with the inside fastball, move back. Don't change your swing. 
It's like the Eagles want Jalen to change his swing. Son, I don't want you to change your swing. Move the game for him. I actually like that, Kyrie. I do. Half the field. He can develop and win. And win. I thought that Steichen did more of that in 22 than what Johnson did in 23. I thought there were more on the numbers throws than in previous year. I'd like to look at that play chart from 22, his passing chart from 22 versus his passing chart from 23 and see if they were drastically different. I am spitballing here. I don't know. They may be exactly the same. But it just seemed to me they were easier passes for him in 22. And I think the reason they were easier passes, they had them more on the move. And you had a dynamic running game that got you 25 touchdowns and 2,000 rushing yards. So if you get back to kind of doing that, moving him around, that could be an absolute positive and give the identity of the team that's a motion team. And get this, if you want to, if you don't want to do motion with your receivers, you move your quarterback around. It's actually brilliant. Okay, it is. It's, it's actually brilliant if you think about it. It's a great way to develop. And they got to find an identity. And you find your identity in the offseason. Not during the year. Remember how you guys kept doing this? When are we going to find out? Who's this guy? What's he? Well, when are they going to play their best ball? When are they going to play their best ball? They never did. Because they never didn't know who they were. They just didn't know. And Jalen didn't know what he was. I think that's even more of the issue why you guys never played your best game. You know why? Jalen Hurts never put an identity down on what he was trying to do because the coordinators, the players, nobody knew what they were doing. And after a while, everyone else, get this, the opponents knew more what you were doing. They knew more with what you were doing than what you thought you were trying to accomplish. They were constantly out thinking you and you had no idea what you were doing. It really got to be chaotic at the end of the year. And that's why you saw this enormous cliff dive. I don't think Barb that Jalen's a strange character. Hey, an introvert, he may be, but that doesn't make him. Hey, Joe Montana, you want to know who an introvert is? Watch Montana back in the day. Montana didn't do many interviews. Joe wasn't great behind the mic. Why did you, did you ever think that Joe Montana, why didn't that guy ever get a TV job? He did win four Super Bowls. You rarely hear from the guy. Why? Because he's not really good behind a mic. He's not an, I'm not saying he's not articulate. He's just not good behind the mic. Okay. Here's something else. Number 11. Top Eagle priorities. Are you going to practice harder? Are you going to change? And practice harder? Or are you going to bail once again on OTAs, break mini camp, and then break training camp? Are you going to have hard practices? Are you going to take them more serious? Goes into this one. Are you going to take pregame? And preseason games, more serious? Don't you think this group here, look, if I had the 2022 group, I might not take the preseason that serious because of all the veteran guys I have. With all the holes I have, new coordinator on both sides of the ball, don't you think you need the quality work and the quality reps to see what you got? Do you really want to line up in Brazil? On September 6th, not knowing what you have? Does it make more sense to get into it early? And if it doesn't count, 
Isn't that when you want to at least find out, hey, at least it doesn't count. If we get killed, we understand. Maybe we can make adjustments now instead of waiting until week four or 13 to change a coordinator out. I mean, I don't know, man. I think you got to practice harder. I think you got to take these uh, – I think you got to take these – these preseason games a little more serious. Those are my 12. Hassan Reddick's deal. Number two, restructure both coordinators. These are top Eagle priorities. What you do with DeAndre Swift? Three. Four, convincing Kelsey to come back. Five, telling Brandon Graham, thank you for your service. You're not coming back to the 2024 Eagles. Number seven, who's Nolan Smith? Number eight. Free agent, safety corner LB. If you're going to spend your money, I'd spend it on the linebacker. And again, those are three positions you're not very good at drafting at. Number nine, wide receiver three is one of the reasons that Jalen Hurts was high in turnovers. All your targets went to two dudes. Became so predictable. It was one of the one of the main reasons that your football team imploded at the end of the year. Number ten, um, getting an identity. Number eleven, practice harder, guys. And number twelve, I think you got to take the preseason a little more serious. Also. Got another topic coming up here in a second. But those are the priorities that they have to come. Hey, by the way, those are things you have to address before you get into free agency. Before you get into the draft, you've got to decide what your game plan is. You think the Eagles have a game plan right now? What is that? What do you think their game plan is? Status quo? A slight course direction? Or do you think, get this, you know what's funny? Angelo thinks 17 was a fluke championship. You know why I don't, I'm not going to say it is? Because you got there last year. Okay? You've been to two Super Bowls in like six years. I don't know. You know? So, if you hadn't gone back in 22, I would have said, he's probably right. But you did get back to a Super Bowl, and you were three points from winning it in 22. So, I don't know. They do things. They do a lot of good things. They do a lot of good things, man. But they do things that cost them the finish line. Bad coaching. Very seldom. Did they have, I mean, hey, man, you, Nick Foles beating Brady. Uh, okay, come on. That's a fluke. Doug Peterson putting that team in a position to win a Super Bowl, that wasn't a fluke. How are we putting the right pieces? That wasn't a fluke. And let's remember something about Foles. He did have a Pro Bowl season in his past where he went 26-2. and two with touchdowns and interceptions. One of the greatest margins I've ever seen for touchdown passes to INTs. He did have a year like that. It wasn't like that guy blew. I mean, we're not talking about C.J. Beathard here. You know what I mean? He had talent. Okay? Yeah, Smiley. This, this guy's had these anomaly games, seven TDs, Outplaying Brady. 
I mean, he has he's Eli. You know, he's a lot like Eli. He's got these flash points. You go, shit. I mean, wait, when you when you watch Foles in the Super Bowl, you thought you were watching Brady. Then you watch him at Jacksonville and you go like this. Damn. Remember, he had those couple years with Jeff Fisher. Uh, totally ruined him. Jeff Fisher. Jeff Fisher not only ruined him, but Vince Young. I mean, completely destroyed Vince Young. Vince Young at one time was 31 and 14 in Tennessee. And he started putting all these stupid bullshit rules up for him. And Jeff Fisher, how that guy kept his job. Look at his last 10 years as a head coach in Tennessee and Los Angeles. Take a look at his last 10 years. I think he had one winning season in 10 years. And everyone kept telling you, well, he's a good coach. I'm like, that guy's not a good coach. He's a quarterback destroyer. I mean, the guy, I mean, I think he not, I think he had a bunch of guys in St. Louis that were quarterbacks. You know, I, I don't think it was Cousins, but I think it was Case Keenum. And he also had Foles in St. Louis. There were, I forget who was on that, on that team with him. That guy couldn't pick a quarterback to save his life, man. Look what he did to Jared Goff. He had Bradford too, right? Yeah, he did. Look what he did to Jared Goff. Shit, if Jeff Fisher had remained the head coach of the Rams in Los Angeles, Jared Goff doesn't go to two NFC Championship games in a Super Bowl. I mean, he doesn't. All right. We're going to take a time out. Don't forget my friend Tone's going to join us. We're going to go over this list with him. And we'll get more from you. I got another topic that I'm going to throw off of you guys. I love this time of the year because we get to go over all the things that we need to address. And also, too, the NFL is just endless when it comes to content. Please hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. Go for the pulse and the pools. Go for the ooze and the oz. Go for the bubbles and the bubbly. Go for the story and the stories. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. 
E-A-G-L-E-S, Eagles. Big Sales National Football Show. Appreciate you guys coming aboard. Please hit the like button. These Georgia guys better get their ass in gear. Jalen Carter, I'm not worried about. Jordan Davis, Nolan Smith, Keeley Ringo. Let's go, dude. Okay? Those guys are the key to the Eagles having success this year on defense. If those guys don't start to show some promise, you got problems. These guys are all high draft choices. They're all high draft choices. These guys have to be the future of your team on defense. Like, that group can't fail. The entire group can't fail. Like, you need a corner. Why are we talking about a corner when you drafted one? Oh, okay. Why are we looking for edge depth when supposedly you got one? Oh. Jordan Davis. Do we need help at DT? Dude, I got to tell you. You, you hurt us with our decision on Fletcher because we drafted you so that we could move off the money. Carter made us move. Here, you understand what they did as, as an organization. They got Carter to move off of Javon Hardgrave. And they got Davis to move off of Fletcher. I'm okay with Jay. Hey, did Jalen Carter have the year that Javon Hardgrave did? No. But I'll take Jalen Carter. Why? Because I don't think he's that much better, Javon Hardgrave, and his money. And I think he'll be a better player at the end of the day. That's what I'm looking at. Jordan Davis, on the other hand, has shown flashes. Wow. Can I get that? Fletcher plays like that all the time. Maybe to not the level we saw in week one through eight that Jordan showed. But Fletcher is a better player. Why? Because he's more consistent with his play. Which makes the 10 million decision harder. I want to get off of him, dude. I drafted you 13th for a reason. There's a reason. I, I drafted you. I need to get cheaper and bet. Hey, when you draft talented players, the objective is to get cheaper and better. Okay? Not get more expensive and worse like you have at your corner position. See that? That's what you have in your defense right now. You're more expensive and worse which means you're getting nothing as a group out of the two dudes at 28 million, 25 million. Holy cow. Okay. You're more expensive and you're not as good. It's not a place to be. Dude, your money is in really bad places right now in defense. Reddick and the corners. Reddick is not going to kill me because you know why? He does produce. However, his production is a non-factor on a shitty defense. If one of those corners had more turnovers this year, dude, get this. Do, do you guys think five turnovers or five interceptions is more, is more important to a defensive team than 13 sacks? Do you? You think five picks by a corner versus 13 sacks. What do you think is more of an influence on a football defensive team in the NFL? What's more impactful? The five turnovers or the 13 sacks? That's right. Turnovers always trump sacks. Always. Okay, what kind of sack total you have? How many, how many um, interceptions did your corners give you this year between Slay and Bradbury? You guys have that number? If Davis would have did his job in year one, Fletch would not have been here in 23. 
10 million would have been spent on TJ Edwards, in my opinion, Tone. Okay. How many sacks did you have last year between um, Slay and Bradbury? How many sacks? How, how many turnovers did you have? Three INTs between Slay and Bradbury? <laughs> Those 12 sacks mean dick to me. I mean nothing. These teams are going up and down the field on you. Hey, and get this. Uh, Hassan Reddick's 13 sacks. You were the worst on first down, and you were the worst in the league on third down completions. Come on, man. Blankenship had three INTs by himself. Yeah, and he's a center fielder. That's kind of good. Dude, just saying. I need turnovers. I need corners that are productive. 12 sacks? Dude, if... Let me t- let, let's say this. If Slay and Bradbury had six sacks between them, those 12 sacks, you might have been in the NFC title game. Because you would have been stopping people. Just saying here, man. Just saying here. All right. I'm going to get to this topic here. Don't forget, Tone's going to join us at 3.30 Eastern time. Will you, will you guys, th- th- this is an observation that I'm making here about Sirianni here. You tell me if the, if you if my observation's off or it's on. Um, How come the owner and general manager are not coming out publicly and saying Sirianni's my guy? We have all the faith in the world in him, and we had no doubt he was coming back as our leader and the head coach of our football team. Have, have, have they come out and said that? Ha, have they come out and, like Jerry Jones did, and endorsed Mike McCarthy? That he, my, my, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think Jerry said, I had no doubt he was always coming back. We, we had no doubt that Mike McCarthy, I actually like what Mike did. He keeps us around the rim. We're right there. He's won 30-some-odd. How many games has he won in three years now? I know he's won 24 games in the last two years. Uh, is it three years in a row? They've won 12 games in a row. So I, I think Jerry's kind of happy with that, right? They won like 36 ball games in like the last three years, the Cowboys. I don't know how pissed off you can be about that with Mike McCarthy. I get it. They get bounced. In, but I mean, really? Do you want to go back to Dave Campo? Do you guys want to go back to Chan Gailey if you're Dallas? So they've won like 36 ball games. Is that correct? I don't know, man. Jerry came out right away and publicly endorsed him. The only time Howie endorsed Nick was at the presser. Nori hasn't said a damn word about Nick. Look out for him at the owners' meetings. It should be very interesting. Yeah, I get this. So the owner hasn't said one promising or endorsing thing about your head coach. You find that weird? About a guy with a 667 win percentage and three playoff appearances. I've never seen it. Your owner, like Angelo says, is yacht shopping. You have one of the worst meltdowns in NFL history. And he's yacht shopping and he doesn't endorse your head coach. You really think they want Nick back? Or do you think they're keeping Nick like they kept a sigh in a box and then they're going to find the right time to jettison him? You think that's already been written on the wall here? That they know when his exit is? There's no redeeming quality why he's back. You think they're just looking for the proper time to pull the channel on him or to pull the ripcord on him? Nobody's really endorsed him. Oh, and by the way, I heard Rob say it, and Rob, Rob... There's something to it. Why do you guys think all the old guys are endorsing Nick Sirianni? It's the leadership of the team. No, it's not. No, it's not. I'll tell you how a transition works. And I'll give you an example of it because I was involved in it. Okay? 
Old players on the team don't want any turnover because you know why? They've already shown who they are. They've already proved themselves to a coach. They don't like change. They don't want change. They don't want some new coach coming in, all these new ideas, getting when a new coach comes in, especially a young coach, they get rid of old guys. Let me tell you what happened when Jimmy Johnson got into Dallas. Tom Rafferty, um, Too Tall Jones, Randy White, um, Danny White, Everson Walls, uh, Eugene Robinson. Not Eugene Robinson, Eugene Lockhart. And there were about six other guys that were from the Landry time. And guess what happened when Jimmy was hired? All but Ed Jones was fired. And they all didn't, including Randy White. They didn't come back. Jimmy didn't want him back. Time to move on. Time to get young. Jimmy would rather go forward, taking a step backwards with new players, new ideas, because I don't want you setting your ways, telling me how to run my team. That's the only reason why the older guys are supporting Sirianni, not because they like Nick, because it's selfish. I don't blame them. Nobody wants to reprove themselves every year. And when you get into a comfort zone, Older players have to reprove themselves, especially to younger coaches. Okay? That's how that dynamic works. New coaches, old players gone. Time for new blood. Look look at what they went through in Houston. (laughs) They fired almost every single guy they had in that roster. Shit, they went through two coaches. Then they finally land on D'Amico Ryan's. That entire roster looks completely different than the two years ago when Deshaun Watson was there. Look, look, look at the, look, hey, any place you go into, you're gonna see roster change. Now, with these new court coaches that are being hired, analytic guys are gonna be more involved in that. Okay, especially in Philly. See, the problem is I think you've held on to your older players just a tad bit too long. And I'm not talking Kelsey or Fletcher. Okay. You know, you kind of hang in there a little bit too long with some of your guys. Say Amalo being allowed to leave, you probably had to let him go. You probably had to let him go because you weren't going to pay. You can't pay everybody. Okay. But they've never really endorsed the guy. They've never really thrown their arms completely. Yeah, I remember that too, Tone, at the uh, press conference. I remember it because I, but the question was asked by somebody, why did you feel, are you confident in bringing Nick back? It was asked. It wasn't something they offered up. Am I right when I say that? It, it, was, it was a question that was asked. It wasn't something that they came out and endorsed themselves. So they kind of answered a question. He, how he answered a question about it more so than giving an endorsement. I don't think answering an, a question is the same as endorsing someone. Yeah, man, I feel comfortable with him. And I feel confident. We feel confident with him. That's more of an answer question thing. Instead of coming out going, I'm very happy to announce that Nick Sirianni will be here. What, what, if you have a 667 win percentage and you've been to the playoffs three years in a row, wouldn't you come out and say this? Nick Sirianni's going to be here a long time. Any coach with a record like that? How come you're not asking the right questions? Any coach with a record like that who has an NFC championship game in three years, has been to the playoffs three years in a row, and has won almost 70% of his ball games, you're not going to say this? Hey, Nick Sirianni is going to be here a long time. I don't know what you, some of you guys are talking about. Silly was full of shit along with Angelo. The, I mean, it's just not making sense to me. There's no endorsement for that. There's ridicule. This guy gets more ridicule than what, I mean, look, you, you, you can justify Belichick at the end because of the lack of talent and wins. 
No, and that guy won six Super Bowls. This guy here, I mean, he keeps his gig. And you're making it seem that like he's better. You so you think Nick Sirianni's a better coach than Bill Belichick? Hmm. Bradbury's failures may have scared them enough to change their ways about holding on to old guys way too long. See, Tone, when you start that, you have to remember analytic guys are going to go and break down players' play. And if they look at Howie and go, okay, then look at this. Analytics should tell you Jason Kelsey should not be a conversation about whether you should bring him back or not. He's underpaid for who he is, what he is, and what he brings to the roster and what he brings to the huddle. He's underpaid. The only reason that the number matches is his age. You, you, you're, you're flirting with disaster if you move that guy out of there. You'll hurt Hertz's development more if you pull Jason Kelsey out of that starting lineup. So then you're going to go new at the center position. The analytic guys are going to go like this. You know, the guy, what did he play last year? 97% of the snaps or 96% of the snaps a year ago on the offensive side. You're going to pull that? The top center in the league who played almost 100% of your reps you're taking him out? Man, good luck. That is a big reach. Losing a starting center like that, I think it's the equivalent of losing a starting left tackle. A premium left tackle. Those guys are hard to find, man. You name me and show me a team. Hey, let me ask you this. Is that kid that plays in Kansas City is that center a pro bowler? Is that the kid Creed Humphrey? Does that kid Creed Humphrey or does he play guard? Who's the center of that team? Did he make the pro bowl last year for the Chiefs? Because the kid they got plays in Kansas City is a pretty good ball player. I watched him play. play. Is, is that Creed Humphrey that plays the center position? You think there's any coincidence he's a pro bowler? And you got Mahomes there? You take Creed Humphrey out of that lineup? How do you think Kansas City's O-line looks? And you want to take Jason Kelsey out of, out of Hertz's hands? I don't get it. I don't see it. It is Creed Humphrey, right? So wait. No coincidence to that? You got the all-pro center in the uh, NFC AFC side, right? Is he not the all-pro center? Hey, Patrick, your guy's getting too old. He makes $10 million, so pay him. I could make the argument that Creed Humphrey's more valuable than Travis Kelsey to Patrick Mahomes. Seals, could you see Jason going and playing with his brother for one year? Oh, man. I never thought that. Let's bring Tone in on that one. Holy cow. How about that one there, Tone? Rick Seals, what's going on, sir? How are you feeling? Good, man. How about Denny just asked the question, what if Jason wants to go and play in Kansas City one year with his brother? Jason Kelsey, his 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 brain don't work like that. I don't think so either. He, he don't work like that. It sounds cute, but he don't work like that. They got Creed Humphrey right there. Man, he's awful good too. Hey, there's no co you see, there's no coincidence, right? That you have a great center. When you have a great center, you just don't let the guy walk out the building. Listen, find me. Um, think about the think about the great quarterbacks in you know in in history, right? Yeah. And I haven't and I haven't done this research, but. Typically, you see a great quarterback, you see a great coach, and a great center. Watch this. Bradshaw, Hall of Famer Mike Webster, uh, Mark Stebnoski, All-Pro Aikman, um, 
Peyton Manny wasn't an all Peyton Manny. Yeah, Saturday, but, Jeff Saturday, Jeff Saturday, not a Hall of Famer, pro. but many All Pros and Pro Bowls. Montana, a Randy Cross, Randy Cross, multiple Pro Bowls. Yep, borderline Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lamar yeah. Jackson. You think it's a you think it's a coincidence that he had one of his best seasons and he had Tyler Linderbaum? Out yeah, of Iowa? Tyler Linderbaum, All Pro center. He's a really good Pro Bowl center. Pro Bowl center. Mm -hmm. I think he came out the same year that Cam Jurgens did. Sure did. Um, Linderbaum was the first rounder. Jurgens was the second center off the board in the second round. I think they're both excellent. Yeah, yeah. Some people, some people felt uh, Cam was uh, a little bit more athletic than Linderbaum. Um, a lot of people were kind of scared of Linderbaum's injury history, but um, regardless, though, both players are pretty good in my opinion. Cam, um, we still have to wait and see what that looks like, but I'm not ready to find out yet. I need Kelsey in the building for another year. I think Linda Baum, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's an Iowa guy. Yeah. Yep. He went to Iowa, and I think that was the case. He got banged up up there a little bit, and they were looking at him as being more robotic. Yep. And I mean, if I'm not mistaken, Iowa. Cam Jurgens is a Nebraska kid. Uh, and correct. He, he moved. He moved better, especially at the combines. Yeah. Now, granted, Linda Baum, size from from a size perspective, is bigger than Cam. He is bigger. Yeah, he's bigger. Um, but to your point, though, yeah, a Linderbaum, yep, he's a pro bowler. So he's – okay. So the two teams that were in the conference championship in the AFC, both teams had pro bowl centers. Correct. <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, the uh, Detroit Lions, is Ragnow up there with golf? I think that is Ragnow. Ragnow is – yep, a center, yep, with golf, yep. And Ragnow was a three-time pro bowler. Three time Pro Bowl and he's only 27. And you and not you, but I got you. People want to take Jason Kelsey. I don't out get of it. The building. I don't get it. I I, I don't I don't understand you where see, the, you see every good team has a Pro Bowl center. I personally don't understand why um people are so comfortable um or so willing to just let Kelsey walk out the door. I pers I personally don't understand it. Um, listen to this though, right? I just want—I just want to throw some numbers around. So, um, okay. So currently, right now, wow, this is interesting. Okay, listen to this. So, I know you—I I know you and I talk all the time about Kelsey being underpaid, right? Yeah, he's underpaid. Listen to this. When and you know, it always goes by position. This is this is where I think the NFL has to do a better job with their franchise tags, right? Their franchise tags aren't just aren't specific enough. You know, the, the same franchise tag shouldn't be the same for a left guard versus a left tackle. It shouldn't be the same. But it, but anyway, that's a different conversation. But I say that to say this. Did you know Jason Kelsey in 2020 and 2023? He was the highest paid center at 14.25 million. Yeah. Frank uh, Frank Ragnall, 13.5 million. Ryan that Jensen right for that position. 13, 13 million. Corey Lindsley and, and with the Chargers, 12.5. Yep. Ryan Kelly. With the, uh, with the Colts, 12.5. I think that's completely um, out of hand and completely wrong because you know why? What's the difference between a center and a guard? Let's see. You here. know what so it is? Guards. There's two guards and one center. Wow, guards making more money 20. than centers? Base, base, base tag is 20 or north that's, of. That's crazy. Like, like Landon Dickerson's going to be up for a $20 million deal. Listen to this. Chris Lindstrom for the Atlanta Falcons, one of the best guards in the league. He leads the NFL in salary in 2023 with 20.5 million. Yeah. Quentin Quentin Nelson is 20 million. L Landon Len, uh, Zach Martin is 18.5, and he's looking for a re-up. Um, Joe Thune with the uh, with the Chiefs, 16 million. Joel Patino with the uh, with the with Joe Patino and Wyatt Teller with the um, Browns, 16 million and 14.2 million respectively. Is I that think Landon, part of free agent? Um, let's find out. It's a really good question. I thought it was yeah. a one-year deal he signed. Zach Martin is currently an unrestricted free. No, I lied. I'm sorry. He has um he, he's entering the last year of his deal. In 2025, okay. in 2025, he'll be a Team free option? agent. Nope, nope. Fully okay. um nope, fully guaranteed. What they did was when they extended him, they, they gave him a fully guaranteed they gave him a bag um, of money. Yeah, they gave him thirty six point eight million up front and just okay, said take it. Be okay, yeah, that's how they got yeah. him back in the building. That's that's the only it's the only way you get him back yeah. in the building. Um, but but yeah, man, uh, 
Landon Dickerson is going to definitely cost the Philadelphia Eagles north of twenty, north of north of seventeen million, north of eighteen million easily. I would easily. make this point to you here that when Dickerson gets on the op- when Dickerson's contract comes up. Because the cap will have gone up, which means Ooh, tax what? go up. When, when you know what? That's a good point. When when he's due, he might make twenty million dollars. He's he's going to because you know why? Okay, in March it goes up eighteen percent, which means the tags all go up. Right, right. So by the time what the tag is twenty right now, right? Let me double check. I I think the tag is twenty. Let's Could see. be eighteen five. Yeah, I think it it, it, re- it recently just uh, moved up. I thought it was a twenty million dollar tag. All right, Fan- franchise tag values like twenty three. You you know. All right. You, uh, all right, here we go. So <clears throat> let's pull this up on screen so we all can get a good view of it because it's important to know this. All yeah, because right. you got to plan out who you're paying. Exactly, and it, and it gives you a barometer of like what you know what players are worth. So here we go. All right. Let's look at this. So, this is the this is the projected franchise tag totals for twenty twenty four. Nineteen nine. Nineteen nine. Mm. See, here's look my at, problem. Look at how shitty, and look how prominent the tight end position is in the NFL today. And the franchise tag is only twelve. Million. And the franchise tag is only twelve million. It's crazy, isn't it? It's less than a safety. It's less than a safety. That's a good. That's a good point. It's less than. It's barely. Running backs are right there. So basically, what the league is saying is running backs and tight ends are of the same value, and that's not true. <laughs> it's not true. That's not. That's not true at all. See, this is my problem with the franchise tags right now. They're not descriptive enough. Offensive linemen shouldn't just be one category, right? A left tackle right. franchise tag should be significantly more than a guards. You know what I mean? Yeah, right um, guard should not have the same tag. Right. As and then, left tackle. Right. And then linebacker and D end. It's complicated because now in this new NFL, you have edge rushers. It's like you have guys who just rush the passer. You have off ball linebackers who don't rush the passer that much. It's like it gets really it gets really convoluted. And I just feel like it gets really messy when it comes to the D ends and the linebackers. Look at look at how Kansas City gets over here. The wide receiver tag is 20. Tight end is 12. I start paying that, Travis Kelsey between twelve and sixteen million dollars. I don't ever have to pay him twenty, and this exactly. is why the tight ends always bitch. You use me like a wide receiver, and I'm basically your wide receiver, and you're paying me tight end base money. It's really that, not a great way to do business. It's not. It's not. It's not. And I don't agree with it, but they're playing by the rules. Yeah, and I get it. Is, it. But, Right, right, and and look, I'm I don't agree with it, but here, but here's my thing, right? If I know this as a businessman and as and as a roster builder, if I know this, I'm looking for a superstar tight end, not a superstar wide receiver. Yes, yeah, because cheaper, that way I get more production. I get more production. I get the I get the same production, if not more. He also helps me in run blocking. I can. He's more. He's more. He's more of a weapon than a wide receiver. He can block. He can catch. You know he can help in the short yard situations, right? I could, um, I could, I could flex him out in the slot. Um, where, where what else? You can do so much with it. And again, the contract. Look at the impact players, Tone. Right. Yeah, you know, the guy in Baltimore, Kittle, Mark Andrews, um, um, Goddard. Yep. Um, uh, the tight end and um, uh, the shit, the tight end that brand new kid up in Detroit. Yes, the tight end in Detroit. Um, um, Laporta. Sam Laporta. Um, TJ Hawkinson and, and with, with Minnesota. Um, and yo, Travis Kelsey. Here's another thing, too, man. Um, what's the name of the GM again for the Lions? Uh, Brad Holmes. Brad Holmes, excuse my language, is a fucking genius. Yeah. And let me tell you why. He took a major risk last year, midseason, trading TJ Hawkinson at the deadline. I everybody ca- that. everybody called him crazy. Player. Everybody called him crazy. You know, he. He he responds to that by finding Sam Laporta out of Iowa, and he was the best rookie tight end. First rookie over seven hundred uh, yards receiving and over seventy catches. You want to know how much force for them? You want to know how much Minnesota paid T.J. Hawkinson? 
Listen to this. Do, do, do you know Goddard makes more than Kelsey? Yes, he does. Listen to this. TJ Hawkinson, the Vikings just gave him this contract, and he got hurt the same year, I think. Yep. TJ Hawkinson, wow. Did you know TJ Hawkinson and Sam Laporte are both, are, are, are both, are both Iowa tight ends? Yes. TJ Hawkinson and Sam Laporta. Now listen to this. Um, the Vikings, after they signed or after they traded for TJ Hawkinson, they gave him a four-year, $66 million contract with $40 million guaranteed. The Lions avoided that completely and jumped right to a tight end in the draft, rookie contract, Sam Laporta. Gave him Absolutely. the same production. Gave him the same production. Absolutely. That's 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 how you build a roster. That's right. Right there. And get this. They moved off of that guy. And if I'm not mistaken, that guy was considered one of the better tight ends and up-and-coming tight ends in the National Football League. Yes, you also, was. not only that, you trade him in the division. Exactly. Okay? Yes. You yes. trade that dude in the division. And on top of that tone, the way that Holmes is doing and building that team through the draft, Detroit's going to be around a long time. Okay, they got to get better in their back end when it comes to their corners and free safeties. Mm -hmm. But I think they will. You know, Gardner Johnson played all but one game. Now, I don't know if they're going to bring him back because if I'm not mistaken, he was on a one year deal that could benefit. Yes, he was. The, that could this. benefit the Lions because he was hurt all year. The Lions currently, right now, are paying Sam Laporta $2.3 million a year. And, and, and he's worth, he'll be worth when his contract is up. He'll be worth north of 12. The, the Vikings are paying TJ Hawkinson $16.5 million a year. Think about that. Hey, that's right, senor. George Kittles and I were tied in too. Mm hmm. And listen to this Sam Laporta played every game. He was healthy on 120 targets, gave them 86 catches and 889 receiving yards and 10 receiving touchdowns. In a rookie year. In a rookie year. TJ Hawkinson in 2023. Only played 15 games because he got hurt. He gave him 95 catches, 127 target on, on 127 targets, 960 receiving yards, and five receiving touchdowns. That's pretty you got, good. Though, considering you got you got the same play. right, right, right. You got the, that is true considering the quarterback play. But my point is, you got the same production, if not more, from a rookie, and you're paying him less. But you lost in Minnesota because you didn't do anything with it, and it was a financial hit on your roster. And a financial exactly. hit on your cap. Okay, Bingo. so hey, I want to go over these priorities with you that I wrote mm -hmm. down earlier. I wrote down about 12 priorities. And I want to go over these with you. And maybe you think one's more than the other here. Okay. Eagle top priorities. I said the number one priority is the Reddick deal. Number two is the restructuring of the cornerback contracts. Number okay. three, what are you going to do with DeAndre Swift? Four, convincing Kelsey to come back. And by the way, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, he usually gives the Eagles a heads up on what he's going to do around the combines. Yeah, he said his decision will be made. Um, within the next couple weeks, that lines up perfectly with the combine. Number five, what to do with Fletcher. Number six, informing Brandon Graham early in this process that he's not coming back to the Eagles for the 24th season. Number seven, who okay. and what is Nolan Smith? I mean, what is he? Number eight, are you going to spend money in free agency at the safety, the corner, and the linebacker? The reason I picked those three, because those are all areas that you don't traditionally right. well, do a good job at. That's true. Okay. Number nine, wide receiver three. You had 36 catches out of... 350 completions for Jalen Hurts. The wonder Hurts had turnovers the way he did. Became so predictable, you didn't spread the ball around. What are you doing at wide receiver three? Number 10, what's your identity going to be on offense? 
Exactly. Are you going to roll more? Is Jalen going to be under center? Mm. What's it going to look like? Number 11. Are you going to practice harder and practice? And finally, are you going to take preseason games and make it more of a priority, especially when you have all these question marks, and the most notably on the defensive side? Tone, I heard you say something earlier. Hmm. I'm not going to say you're wrong, but I'm going to throw this at you. Right. Championship football teams are made in the postseason, and what you do in the postseason, you have to have a game plan set up for all these things that are going to happen for your team. Oh, the all season. If you're waiting for September and you think you're going to build an identity or you're going to all of a sudden have time and waiting till September, you don't have time. You have to right now, the decisions that you make, the contract negotiations, the pivot and free agency if a guy gets signed, if the kid from Chicago maybe you're targeting, they re-up him, what's the mm -hmm. direction you're going there? Are you going to look at Sertan or are you going to go into the draft? There's a, there's a lot in a game plan on when you hit these calendar dates, free agency, right. the draft, OTAs, mini camp, then training camp. You have to have all this decided by training camp. No, yeah, you bring up a good point. You know, here's the thing, right? I do I do like your priority list, by the way, um, because I do believe the Reddick situation has to get figured out before you do anything else. Um, look, I'm, the, the one that stands out to me the most – might be the free agent or draft safety corner linebacker. Number eight. That stands out to me a lot. Um, you know why I, do... I started with Reddick and with uh, the two corners? It's because it's the money. It's the money. It's the money. It's, it's the money. And, and, and philosophically, you're looking on how to rebuild because you're you've got to make a decision here, Tone. Right. But see, are they going to be blinded by their ego, or are they going to be? Looking in a mirror going, man, every time we bring a safety in or we bring a corner in mm -hmm. or we draft a linebacker. By the way, the guy we even had in here that was good, we didn't draft. We found him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 that is a philosophical mentality because you're right. Do I trust Howie in the draft? No. Do I trust him in free agency? More so than in the draft. Yeah, right. So for me – I like what you said earlier about the fact that if it was up to you, go linebacker and free agency. Because me personally, at that position, I need more experience there than anywhere else. You know, we can't afford to have a guy out there that doesn't really know what he's doing, right? You need a um, Jason Kelsey on your defense at the Mike Backer. That's exactly. why I like that kid Gay Jr. in Kansas City. Yeah, I think you and I, you and I talk about that offline a lot. You know, Will, 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 Willie Gay is a guy I'm very interested in. Um, the funny thing about the Philadelphia Eagles right now is, and you, and you said this earlier, right, especially when it comes to Nick Sirianni, they haven't come out and endorsed them. They haven't, they, they, they haven't, they haven't really, they haven't really said anything too, too committal, right? Not even the owner has said nothing. And, and, and also, why was it so easy for them just to just strip him like this? You know, all those kind of things. You want to know why? Because they believe in their process more than people. They don't believe he's the reason why they are where they are. Okay, well, then with that mentality that you're talking there, if you believe that, they've got a date on the wall in mind that if this thing doesn't look like this, priorities are going to be addressed on what's the best for the team. Agreed. Agreed. I, I, mean, I, 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 I think on there's a date on the calendar at the Novacare Center for Howie and for Jeffrey. If yep. it doesn't look like this. And I think it's, I think it's about – Yep, I think it's week seven, week eight. I think I, I think that's their cutoff. So when's the trade deadline? But, but, but I get this tone. But what's the point of going through that when you could have cut yourself clean of that? Me, it's so funny you say that. Me and Rob were talking about this earlier. You know, I firmly believe that you, he is going to create on. more drama. Yes, yes. Why not just pull the bandaid off now? They're so Start caught the up in process, right? They're, they're so caught up in how we how they're being viewed. And the fact of the matter is, in my humble opinion, I think Nick Sirianni being here is a PR stunt. I really do. 
That's my honest belief. Yeah. I said it on Sports Take. I've I've said it on every platform that I've been on. I I think he's a lame duck head coach that still has money left on the contract. I think the Philadelphia Eagles have already listen. The Philadelphia Eagles are habitually known for hedging their bet. I could point out small. I could point out two, I could point out two recent examples where they've hedged their bet. The most recent, they've hedged their bet. Matt Patricia and Sean Desai. They hire Sean Desai. A month later, they bring in Matt Patricia. Or however long later, but they brought in Matt Patricia to watch Sean, uh, Sean Desai. They hedged their bet there. It failed. I'll take it a step further. And we talk about this all the time. They had two first-round draft picks that year Jalen Hurts became the starter. They they made a play for well, they made a play for Watson and they made a play for Wilson. They couldn't get either of them. So they say, you know what? Okay, we're going to lean in even harder on Jalen Hurts. But my point is they hedged their bet. They had two first round picks. They could have made a move, but they didn't. So that was that. So again, when it comes to Nick Sirianni, they bring in Vic Fangio, a guy who's been doing this at a high level for 20 plus years in the NFL. Then you bring in Kellen Moore, a guy who's been calling plays in the NFL for five plus years. You brought in two people who had more experience than him and surrounded him with those two guys. You think they haven't already considered the fact that if Nick Sirianni doesn't put up, they're going to definitely remove him out the building, and they're going to elevate either Vic Fangio or Kellen Moore as the interim head coach. And then the following season, they're going to solidify which one of those guys will be the long-term head coach because that way that can prevent them from having to unload the entire coaching staff again in back-to-back seasons. That's how they protect themselves. You know, I got to tell you, though, I'm I'm kind of in agreement with, with Senor here with this. I mean, Tone, their behavior is erratic. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. It's erratic. I mean, mm-hmm. you go, it's it's like going and hiring me or you as a coordinator and then turning around and hiring Bill Belichick as your D coordinator the next year. Mm-hmm. Why, why, why in publicly what you've done is you basically told your coach on September 25th, just using a date. Mm-hmm. This thing don't look like this. We're firing you. I agree. And let me ask you this, right? Because they've done things one way for so long, do we is it fair to surmise that this Kellen and Moore Vic Fangio hire? Is it fair to say that this is their way of trying to slowly transition into a more experienced way of coaching? And hiring an experience, and- setting it. So you think potentially they're setting this thing up for Belichick? I didn't think that far ahead, but hey, you may be on to something. Because or Vrabel. Like you, possibly. Or Vrabel. But here's the thing. When you do that, you potentially may have to unload an entire staff again. And I don't know. I don't I don't think they want to do that. That's why I think either it's going to be Vic Fangio or Kellen Moore. Likely Vic Fangio because of the experience. That's if he wants the job. But again. That's so far in the future, but I'm telling you, I really believe that Nick Sirianni is on thin ice, and it's on. If, if if they start that season two and four, or two and five, or three and four, however you want to slice it, if, if they're if they're under five hundred by week seven, I think he's fired. Hey Tone, do me a favor. I I, I got an emergency. I got to take a break here. I don't sure. come back on the other side with me here. I got because I want to finish this up. Okay. Yes. So let's take a time out here. And keep it here on the National Football Show. We'll be right back. bubbles and the bubbly go for the story and the stories go for the win go to ocean casino resort book your trip at theoceanac.com
Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday, watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Good Please hit the like button. Thank you guys so much for coming aboard with us here. We're going over, again, some of the priorities in the offseason here for the Eagles. Please hit the like button. We really appreciate you guys coming aboard. Um, you know, let me let me, let me me go here with you, Tony, and I want to go down the list here. So as, when you look over the list here that I gave you on the priorities, I like right. your number. You, you, you think number eight is a bigger priority because you got to decide whether or not what you're going to do on safety corner or linebacker. Um, I think it's the Reddick and the corner deals. Right. Well, you know, let me, you know, I want to make it clear, you know, I, I didn't necessarily say eight was more important. I just, I, I, it stands out to me, but I think the money always comes before anything. The money yep. got to make sense before you can even get to number eight. So I think if, if, if I'm, if I'm ranking them, I do agree that the Reddick deal and the cornerback contracts have to be renegotiated well before they even think about who they're going to bring in on this roster because you need money. You need flexibility. Okay. The Nolan Smith thing. Yes. What is he and who is he? How much of a priority is that? I think Nolan Smith's future with the Philadelphia. It It impacts the Reddick deal. Absolutely. Tremendously, because here's the thing, right? The Philadelphia Nolan Smith is his importance to the future of this Philadelphia Eagles team is more was more important than probably most people realize. They drafted Nolan Smith to replace Hassan Reddick. It was quite it was quite obvious. He's a, he's a carbon copy of him from top to bottom. Um, now do I prefer undersized guys on the edge? No, but they drafted him, so I'm rolling with him. Um, here's the thing, though. Um, Nolan Smith not showing you anything in his rookie year completely offsets their game plan when it came to moving on from Hamza Reddick. If Nolan Smith would have been able to come in and actually deliver some actual production, if they would have gave him an opportunity to be really productive in the NFL, then moving on from Hamza Reddick would have been a no-brainer. He probably he, he probably wouldn't even been, it probably wouldn't even been in the news. He would just he would have got traded instantly. You know, it would have been no conversation, no debate about a contract negotiation. He would have got traded. That was the game plan because they knew. Remember, they said that they knew Reddick's contract was coming. They knew that the cap hit was going to be north of 20 million in 2024. They knew this. They set it up just like that. So when they drafted Nolan, they said to themselves, okay, we got this kid that we think can that we think can supplant uh Hassan Reddick. That gives us the perfect transition from him. But because again, Nolan didn't pan out quite yet, Reddick holds the leverage in that regard. So Nolan Smith turning into a player is imperative. You said it earlier. Nolan Smith, uh, Jordan Davis, Nicole Dean, Killy Ringo, Jalen Carter. Those players, in theory, are the future of the Philadelphia Eagles defense. If those players don't pan out, All right. the, Eagles are, the Eagles are in deep trouble. Deep. Because you wasted, what's that, five draft picks? Yeah. And two first in that? And, and, three, and you basically first. put all your first. I'm and sorry, you three basically first basically put all of your draft integrity into a program in Georgia, yes. which makes it even more suspect of a look that you're banking on those guys because they had great careers at the college level that it would have translated into the NFL level. And mm-hmm. if only one of those players, Tone, it's a failure. Pans out. It's a failure. It was a complete philosophical, analytical disaster. And three of those players are first-round draft picks. So you mean to tell me if only one of the three first-round draft picks pan out, that's a failing grade. That's 33%. And think about this. 
how they do business. You know, when they moved off of Carson Wentz, mm-hmm. they really never knew if Jalen could play or not. They didn't know. They okay. Didn't know. Well, when they moved off of TJ Edwards and Kaiser and Marcus Epps and Gardner Johnson, and they just thought that they had what you call their process mm-hmm. and not having seen any players that played in their system that could have taken all of those positions. I mean, at the end of the day, where do you come up with handing positions because you think Nolan Smith can take? So my, my point is going to come down to this. Do they think that they could just put in Nolan Smith like they put in N'Kobe Dean to replace TJ Edwards? Because at the, at the end of the day, this is what they've done. Mm-hmm. Hey, Rid of apps, they put right. Am I right? They put blanket ship in there, right? Right, right. Okay. Well, blanket ship's kind of a replacement. Epps is a better player. Yeah, yeah. Epps is more athletic. Um, how, how, do you, how do you replace players when you don't know if they can play? That's a good question. Don't most don't, to your point though. Don't most NFL teams ultimately have to take certain risk when it comes to moving up certain players? I mean. It, are, are, isn't it? Aren't you doing a lot of gambling in general? I like, like, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I'm not trying to make an excuse, but I'm trying. I guess I'm trying to figure out, isn't that the norm in the league? Sometimes, sometimes you got to take a chance on a guy and see if he can actually play. See, I think most of them. And when you're okay, here, here and, and, and it's a good, it's a good question. Like, look at Jalen Carter. Jalen right. Carter didn't have the year that Javon Hardgrave had this year right. in um, San Francisco. Wasn't horrible. He's right. kind of close. Right. And he's a rookie. He's cheaper. He's cheaper. And I think he's going to be better. And I think he's better. That's how it should look. Right. Like, right. here's a complete bomb. Mozzie Smith in Dallas. Yes. Had no reps. Had I mean, he barely played. He's a first rounder. You're supposed to be replacing the guys in the interior in there. On a rookie guy, and he your did point. nothing for them. To, to your point, here's the problem with the Philadelphia Eagles, and here's the difference. You mentioned Jalen Carter. I like that example because you clearly saw a game plan for getting him involved. You saw it, right? The difference between Jalen Carter and, for example, Nolan Smith, there was no game plan to get him involved. Yep. You traded Derek Barnett, and still you didn't give Nolan Smith more reps. Nolan Smith should have been getting – routinely at minimum 20 reps a game at least they didn't do that for some reason he was only averaging about six or seven reps a game if that so my my point is to your point about putting young guys in position and having guys in place so you can transition and knowing exactly what you're getting you know with Jalen Carter you know he was highly touted in college but ultimately you don't know what he's going to be in the league but still, you saw a game plan for them getting him involved, and it allowed him to grow and develop in real time. They didn't dedicate that same intentionality to Nolan Smith. They were not intentional about getting Nolan Smith in that field. If it was up to me, Nolan Smith would have been Hassan Reddick's swing guy the entire season. The moment Hassan Reddick's off the field, Nolan, you're in. But no, they, for some reason, dragged their feet. For some reason, they were trying to... For some reason, they forced Josh Sweat to play uh, extra snaps, and they wasn't even putting BG on the field like that. Like, it, 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 it was insane. For some reason, they did not want to put, and this may be a Sean side thing, for some reason, they really, they rarely took out Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat. They didn't let those guys really get any rest. I don't understand why. And then all of a sudden, you start getting injuries, and now you want to throw Noah Smith to the wolves, and you want him to be a guy all of a sudden. That, I don't think that's right. No. How can you how can you develop a guy with no game plan? You can't. You can't. You can't. And, and and but it, it, that's the ship. Again, the house was already tell, burning. That's not playing him in the exhibition season, too. To your point about that, he played, but he got hurt, and he couldn't. He couldn't play the. I think he couldn't play the last two games, or something like that. It was, some, Dude, it was all something. All the young that, guys uh, should be playing in the exhibition season. A shitload of plays. I agree. I agree hundred percent. I don't want to find out in Brazil what we have. I want to find out week one of the exhibition season what we have. Agreed. I'm totally in line with that. I mean, if I had a if I had the 22 team, 
I'd be more apt to do this. All right. You know, I mean, I'm going to sit, guys, because these guys are experienced. They know what the hell they're doing. I don't have to tell Sue what he needs to do and Linville Joseph and Fletcher. I don't have to, I don't have to say all that. So, you know, but a group like this with the new coordinator and all that, man, yeah. no way. He's got was- to get out there and play. John so and that I philosophy talk- has to change. Yes, it was flawed. John and I talked about this all year. In week one, Sidney Brown should have been a starter. Um, they should have had they should have found a way to get Keely Ringo on the field. And Nolan Smith should have been rotating between Josh Sweat and um Hassan Reddick regularly. Regularly. Whoever's if either of those guys are off the field, Nolan, you're in. I don't care. I don't care if you're on the weak side or the strong side, you're in. That way, you can go through the startup calls. You can go through the growing pains early when the stakes aren't as high. They didn't put Sidney Brown in until they dealt with injuries. And then they're, they're expecting him to be a productive player or at least hold it down. Not That's not fair. Noel Smith, same thing. It's not right. Their process when it came to developing every player except for Jalen Carter was flawed from top to bottom. I don't think you could put a young player in a game and give him – 15 to 20 reps, like Yale saying, man, I'll tell you this. I just, I don't think you get a rhythm. I don't think you get a feel. I don't think you can just spot play certain young guys. I think you got to throw them in there and you got to, hey, that's what exactly what Kansas City did. To your Dude, point, at the though, beginning of the year, Kansas City was getting beat by teams like the Raiders. Right. I mean, they were just, it, it you you but, saw them wobbling all over the place. Right. To and your point, this, though, isn't it all of hard a sudden to do it that? Clicked. You know why? The more you do it, Tone, and if you believe your players are good athletes, they'll figure it out. Right, right. To your to, to your point, what do you do when you have legitimate veterans in front of those guys? They they should be the the young guys should be their rotator guy, right? Yep. Right, and that's all, and that's what I'm saying for the Eagles in particular. Josh Sweat and Hassan Reddick, you're bona fide starters, no question. I feel like I'm not starting n- Fletcher Cox. That's my point. I felt like Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis should have been the or starters. Milton, or even Milton. But week one, I felt like Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter should have been my starters. Yes, and then Fletch is my swing guy because yeah. I want his I want his motor running hot. Yeah, I don't want him overworking because he's more valuable to me at fifty. He, Fletcher at 50 Cox snaps. is going to give me the same production tone if he starts or he doesn't. Right, he might give you more if he if he's if he's might not give starting. you more, like BG did last year. But this year, in my humble opinion, I don't think they even used BG enough, and they didn't use Nolan Smith nowhere near enough. And I think it bit him on the ass in terms of um, the conditioning for the defensive line. For some reason, Sean Desai and those guys did not have trust in Nolan Smith, did not have trust in BG, did not get Sidney Brown on the field early enough. There was just malfeasance and malpractice all across that defense when it came to utilizing their personnel. And that's my opinion. You know, I said that there's no chance in hell that DeAndre Swift's coming back. And I agree, I agreed with you. And then and then you think and when you look at the CBS market came up with the top 25 free agents, and his name ain't on that list. That Pro tells you that Focus he may come back. Has him sixth. Now let me put this out there to you. We saw what the cap number was for mm-hmm. running backs. It's like nine nine, right? Yes, uh 10 point. I think it's 11.1. 11. 11.1. 11. Yeah. Well, there's not a back who's going to be – there's not a back in free agency zone that's going to get 11.1. And that includes Saquon Barkley. He ain't getting 11.1. Teams don't build their football teams around running backs anymore. That's not going to happen. You're not spending that money there. Right. I say the most he gets is what? What would – what would this – would you agree him or Josh Jacobs is the two highest guys that are going to – what do you think? Eight million, nine million, maybe those so, guys a high. So DeAndre Swift, he's interesting because you know his his market value right now is I believe six six point seven million. That's what his market value is. But when I He'll look at the running back that. position, he's not going to get that. When you got Derrick Henry on the free on the market, Josh Jacobs on the market, Saquon Barkley on the market, 
Tony Pollard, Austin Eckler, who I think is better than Swift. Um, you got Cordell Patterson, Gus Edwards, Ezekiel Elliott, Devin Singletary, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, and then you get DeAndre Swift. I mean, there's a lot of people in this market right now who are going to get more money. There's a few people who I think will get more money than him. But when you think about it from that perspective, because it's so oversaturated, you got J.K. Dobbins and all the guys like that. A.J. Dillon, Kareem Hunt is available. Um, when it's that loaded with running backs, it becomes a buyer's market, not a seller's market. Therefore, the buyer is always going to dictate what your value is. Do you think and if he rolled in at 4-5, the Eagles would entertain that? That's a good question. So now we got to think about this, right? How much did the, how much did the Philadelphia Eagles spend at the running back position in total last year? That's what we got to ask ourselves. So as right now, the Philadelphia Eagles, when it came to positional spending for the running back position in 2023, they spent a grand total of five point their cap when it came to the running back position. 5.24 million. Now, as far as total cash, as far as total cash, though, when it came to the running back position, they spent the grand total of 5.9 million. So 5.9 million went into the players' pockets um, in 2023 when it came to the running back position. That's that's just that's about 2% of their cap. So to your point about DeAndre Swift, if they were to give him about $4 million, $4.5 million, yes, that's under. That's under how much they spent for the total position. But remember, that's between five guys. So are they willing to allocate that much money to one guy and then they draft the guy? I think that's the case. You already got Kenny Gangwell on the roster right now. Um, going into 2024, going into 2024 when it comes to the money given to the running back position, currently the Philadelphia Eagles are spending $1.9 million on a running back position. That's between two guys, Kenny Gangwell at one point one million, and you have this other guy, Lou Nichols the third, at seven hundred ninety five thousand. So as of right now, they're only spending close to two million dollars on a running back position. Are they going to spend an additional four point five, which will increase the amount of money they allocated from the previous season into this season? That's the that's the question. They Are they going to spend him? more? Will they are from? That's the question. I think I wouldn't be surprised if they allow him obviously to hit the market and. They, they they see what he's getting offered. And then his representation comes back to Philly and said, look, we've got, you know, we've received these offers and we're prepared to take either one. Do you have anything to add to it? If the Philadelphia Eagles don't feel like they can match or don't feel like they want to match, I think DeAndre Swift is gone. That begs the question, who in the league will give DeAndre Swift north of $4 million a season with the running back market looking the way it is? You know, who needs a running back right now? Now, depending on what the money is. And these days, tone, I'll go in a draft. And bingo. A lot of these teams are thinking, I'll go in a draft. Why, yeah, why, would, I, why, would, I, why, would, I, why would I give him $5 million I can go in a draft and pay a guy $1 million? Especially when that is not a priority on my football team, when I could do things. Look, look, look like you said, how much money are the um, – how much, how much money are the Lions spending on their backs and what they decided to do? Instead of restructuring a contract for Swift and trading him on tra on draft day, they decided to go in a different direction. Instead of dealing with his contract, they went and drafted a kid, and they signed a veteran. And that, right, to me, so is the process that I think that most teams are going to do when it comes to that position. Okay. So, in 2023, the Detroit Lions ended up spending $7.4 million against the cap for five running backs. Now, I'll say this. Between Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery, who were their primary backs, they ended up spending $6 million between those two guys. Okay. So, $6 million on two guys? I break it up to $3 million a piece? Sure. Right. Not bad. No. And David Montgomery, in my opinion, was a top five running back last year. At 20... And both guys... And both guys Jameer Gibbs, 21. David Montgomery, 26. You get Jameer Gibbs on a rookie deal. You are, you just gave David Montgomery a contract. You gave him a three-year deal. You see, worth. the rookie balances it. Right. And, and matter of fact, here's another good thing. We might be getting somewhere. David Montgomery, in my opinion, is a better running back than DeAndre Swift. Guess how much David Montgomery got on the open market last year from the Lions? 
How much? They they gave him they gave him an average salary of six million dollars. DeAndre Swift is not getting six, $6 million. million bucks. Three years, 18 million, 11 million total guarantees. Average salary of six million dollars. That's David Montgomery. Let in, in 2023, David Montgomery put up in 14 games played, 219 attempts, 1,000 rushing yards, averaged over four and a half yards in attempt, 13 rushing touchdowns. And Jameer Gibbs, on the other hand, he managed to put up. <clears throat> Romani, Jameer Gibbs is on a rookie contract. He's currently making an average of an average salary of four point four million a year. But you know how rookie contracts go; they don't get most of their money to the back end. So, in terms of production, Jameer Gibbs gave them one hundred and eighty-two attempts, nine hundred and forty-five rushing yards, at five yards an attempt with ten rushing TDs and one receiving touchdown. He also gave them fifty-two receptions and three hundred and sixteen receiving yards. So they got over they got over twelve hundred yards of production from Jameer Gibbs and over a thousand yards of production from um, um, David Montgomery. If David Montgomery is making six million a year, completely upgraded. If David Montgomery is making six million a year and he's better than DeAndre Swift, what do you think DeAndre Swift's getting? He's not getting six. No, hell no. He might get Uh, right. He he He, may get three. You can make an argument. I was just about to say he'd be lucky to get three and a half or four. He's not getting a Miles Sanders six. On top of that, remind you, remember, in last year's running back market, Miles Sanders was the only guy available. Yep. Hence why the Panthers. That's right. Hey, with this running back market, this offseason, Saquon Barkley, Josh Jacobs, all those guys I mentioned. Now that you have all those options, why, why, and why in the hell would you ever pay DeAndre Swift six point five million when you can probably give that money to a Josh Jacobs? He's probably going to get three and a half. Senor, if that. Unlike you, I like debates that could change opinions. Unlike you, my friend. I say that in just kid. I love you. <laughs> All right. Um, I saw I heard that guy that was on with you earlier with you and oh, Rob. Yeah, my, oh, yeah, I got Matt Lombardo. Dude, you you really think there's a big market for um you really think that there's a giant market for Hassan Reddick? <sighs> you know, when he said that I was I, I was I was intrigued because it made me think about who needs edge rushers, right? And he mentioned Atlanta. Um, he even mentioned the Cardinals like you did, remember? So, um, Which, the by league... the way, everyone kind of was like, then they draft him? Yeah, but you forget, Gannon's there, and he played for Gannon. Exactly. So that X's that out. Right, right. And uh, when he said that, it, it made me think because, look, you know, re- regardless of my opinion of Reddick and regardless of your opinion of Reddick, the league is putting a high premium on pass rushers. Obviously, you and I know he's undersized. You and I know he has his limitations, but the league is looking at it like this. Damn, four back-to-back seasons, double-digit sacks, 19 and a half sacks in 2022, 11 sacks in 10 games in 2020 in 2023. On top of yeah. that, here's another thing as well. This is another thing that's working in his favor, and I think we talked about this briefly. When they changed from Matt Patricia, that affected his production. The league is aware of the fact that he doesn't. He doesn't. He he should not be dropping back. And he started the season out with the cast. With the cast. So the league is looking at it like this. Okay, he started off slow. Why? Because of the cast. As soon as it came off, he gave you eleven sacks in ten games, and then the final four games of the year, Patricia takes over, no sacks. So they're looking at it like you put him in. You you put him in a situation. You put him in a situation where he's actually doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's going to get you those sacks. So again, regardless of how I feel and how you feel, the league is value, the league is valuing him high. And that's what I'm hearing. For me, Tone, if I have two corners, he's important to me. If I don't, he's not. Because I got to put up priorities on turnovers, not sacks. I get it. And I get it. with the rebuild that you're going, see, you're going through a rebuild, not you, but other people don't want to admit it. You're rebuilding your defense completely from the coordinator down. And to have a Agreed. guy with 12 sacks who your defense had three total turnovers between your two expensive corners. You guys had three yeah. interceptions between Bradbury and Slay. Hey, dude, that 12, those 12 sacks mean nothing to me. 
They brought nothing to the table, especially down the stretch, especially when he was not coached correctly. Okay, you want to make all that? Fantastic. Remember, the culture's not changing in Philly. Okay? Just the names are changing in yep. Philly. Yeah, think about it like this too, right? Think about it like this. Remember when Robert Quinn – and remember Robert Quinn was on the Bears, right, and he was putting up all those sack numbers? The Bears moved on because they're not good. They're not winning. So why pay right. an edge rusher the money if I'm not winning? So That's right. Same so with Khalil point, Mack. Same, same with Khalil, with Mack. Khalil Mack when they were at the Chargers. No, no, the right. Raiders. When he right. was with the Raiders, the Raiders moved him to Chicago. Why? Didn't matter what the sacks were bringing. He was a good football player with the Raiders. But you know what the Raiders looked at? The defense was terrible. Having all those sacks, if we can't get turnovers, bring nothing to the table to me. Right, I'm not getting turnovers. So they and moved I'm losing. Khalil Mack in his prime. You're yes, telling in his me prime. you're talking about Hassan Reddick on a football team that really is not going to do anything with those twelve sacks. That should That's give a you priority a, paying him. Not that should Philly. give you that should give you an idea of the situation that Philadelphia Eagles are in. The Raiders traded Khalil Mack in his prime because he was getting sacks. But they weren't winning games, and the defense wasn't forced to turnovers, and they were just bad. Why am I paying? Why would I pay a guy big money at that position? Yeah, he's productive, but what is it getting me? No. So again, so again, the Philadelphia Eagles are looking at it like the same way. That defense, yeah, he had all that production in ten games, but the reality is that defense was one of the worst teams when it came to sacks. They weren't in the top ten at all. I think they were like ranked fifteenth. Um, they were the worst pass defense in the league. They forced no turnovers. So when you think when you put and they were all getting that in, killed on first and second down and, and in they, the passing game. And they were getting killed in first and third, first and second down, not just in the passing game, but in the run game as well. The run defense went from being top, the one the run defense went from being the best in the league through the first several weeks to being the worst in the league. They went from giving up 60 yards a game. I'm sorry, they went from giving up about 80 to 90 yards a game rushing. To oh, about 150. 69 at one time. No, no, you're right. I'm sorry. I have I have my math wrong. They were they were giving up about 70 yards a game, like the first eight weeks. After the bye week, they went from giving up about 70 yards a game to about 140, 150 yards a game. Meanwhile, Hans Reddick is on that line. Josh Sweat is on that line. Fletcher Cox is on that line. Jordan Davis, Jalen Carter, they're all on that line. So again, why would I pay a guy all this money if the production isn't translating to defensive success? So I say all that to say there's a strong chance Hassan Reddick may be moved if they can't come to a financial agreement because Look I think the Eagles Miller like him. Moved in Denver. Say that again. Look at Von Miller being moved in Denver. Yeah, they let him walk. And he, there's a Super Bowl MVP. And they let him walk. And they let him walk and they let him walk to the Rams. Okay. And now he's up in Buffalo. Yep. He went to teams that needed pass rushers that had really good players on it. You know, I was even saying this about Aaron Donald. But you see, uh, and, and I think I heard you say this, or someone say it, the Rams are turning it around quicker than I thought they were going to turn it yeah, around. Yeah, that was me. Yep, that, that, was thing's me. Getting, that thing's getting better. And I was saying this. Trade you know, Donald, right? Everybody was saying that. No, but I'm, then I'm going like this. You're going to pay a defensive tackle $30 million when your defense is really not going anywhere. But then all of a sudden they draft a kid from Wake Forest, the kid Turner. Yep. They put him on the other side of him. All of a sudden that defense is starting to look better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're hitting on their later draft picks. All of a sudden they hit on this Puku Nakua kid. Mm -hmm. These are all later picks. Think about what they got in the draft, Tone. Puku Nakua and that kid Kobe Turner. Those guys weren't first rounders. But if you redrafted them again, they'd all be first rounders. So the Rams are turning it exactly. around. Why? They hit on picks. Because they Absolutely. don't have the money. Yep. And look, statistically, statistically, the Rams defense wasn't really that great statistically. But if you watch the games, you see the strides they were making. And I talked about this, right? I think by week 13, the Eagles were – or I'm sorry, entering week 13, the Eagles were 10 and 1, and the Rams, I believe they were five and six. Something Each, like that. Something yes. like that. 
And guess what the record was between the Eagles and the Rams? The Eagles ended the season 11 and 6. The Rams ended the season 10 and 7. One more win. One more win. And at week 13, they were 5 and 6 and you were 10 and 1. So they that Rams team got better significantly and they figured it out. That speaks to coaching, that speaks to player development, that speaks to staying the course and not panicking. The Eagles, on the other hand, coaching lacked, production lacked. They didn't stay the course. They panicked. And lo and behold, we got what we got on defense, and the Rams' defense significantly improved. They went from being one of the worst defenses to being, I want to say, a top 14 defense in terms of scoring. They were only giving up about 22 points per game. So, look, man, the Eagles got some decisions to make. And um, the bottom line is it, it starts with Hassan Reddick and those cornerbacks in their contracts. Yep. They're going to have to they're going to have to restructure, figure something out. If Hassan Reddick doesn't want to move or bite, they're going to have to trade him. You know, before we bring Jason Cole in here, um, would you make of the OK, what, 20 couple couple hours, a couple days now after the Wilkes firing, would you make it up? I don't like it. I feel like I, I still believe he was scapegoated. I still believe Steve Wilkes is a guy that wasn't the reason you lost that Super Bowl. Um, I feel like Kyle Shanahan undermined him in that Super Bowl as well, calling a timeout on one of his plays. Um, I just, again, you in the first half, you allowed only three points to Patrick Mahomes. Only three points. And you only surrendered 19 the entire regulation game. Exactly. And the only reason Patrick Mahomes and that team put up another touchdown was because you fumbled on the punt. So again, was Steve Wilkes really the problem, or was the offense a problem? How about Samuel this, you play the old rules. First team to score wins. Niners won the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's but those you are. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But again, Debo Samuel. I get it. Where was he? No, nope. George Kittle. Where was he? I, I get you know all that. So? And that's, that's all. I just, I, don't, I just don't think Steve Wilkes was the root of their issue in that Super Bowl. That's all. All right, Tone. <laughs> great stuff. Yes, sir. It's always a pleasure. I appreciate you. You bet it, man. That's my good friend, Tom. We're going to go to my friend, Jason Cole, now. And let's start right there. Jace, I mean, we'll get to the Super Bowl here in a minute. What was your takeaway on the Wilkes firing? Um, I thought it was very little to do with the Super Bowl, but more to do with what happened over the course of the season. If it had been the Super Bowl, I think that Shanahan would have taken more time. Um and would have been more considerate and let the anger of the moment uh, dissipate. I think that in looking over the season, and if you look at when he when he brought Wilkes down from the booth to put him on the sideline, and you look at some critical moments during the regular season, like the Baltimore game, when they weren't great on defense. Now, that, they didn't lose that because of the defense. They lost that because of the turnovers in that game, but they weren't great. If you look at the two, the first two playoff games that they played against Green Bay and Detroit, they didn't show up for the Green Bay game, especially on the defensive line. Um, and the defensive line didn't show up at all during the first half of the game against Detroit. Not at all. They got, you know, they were in grave danger of losing that game. Now, the defensive line did show up in the Super Bowl and played great. But I think that there were issues during the season that Shanahan chose not to fix, maybe for philosophical reasons, um, and decided to go a different direction. But I don't think that that defense played with the kind of urgency he's asking for. And, and people are focused on the Super Bowl, and I don't think they're looking back at the regular season. Now, all I had said, I would have thought, okay, let's have a meeting and discuss how are we going to get better? What are we going to do? Um, what's going to be available? You know, how do we do these things going forward? Um, you you would think that you would give Wilkes a chance at that, but maybe Shanahan's got another move up his sleeve. Like, you don't fire a good coach unless you know you've got a better coach lined up. Right? Like Vrabel. Whoever it happens to be, Right. Like somebody you know, somebody you work with, somebody you trust. You know, he did this with an intention. Um, and so I understand why people are confused. I understand why people, um, you know, question it. I understand that people think that he's being scapegoated for the Super Bowl. But if you really know what happened to them over the course of the season, 
I think there are other things that were bothering Shanahan all throughout the season. Whether that's legitimate enough to get him fired or not is a reasonable question. Like, I don't think it was on face value. That's why I was surprised by it. But maybe, just maybe, Shanahan's looking at this going, I got a chance to get a guy who I think is really, truly special, and I'm going to take that chance. How about this, Jace? Was he always perceived as an outsider or like a stopgap guy from Robert Sala and from D'Amico that those were guys that were, you know, that were elevated and Kyle really liked and felt comfortable with them and that Steve was kind of just like a Band-Aid. And it, it, it just, to me, felt during the season it was kind of like a Band-Aid until they could kind of get their ship in, uh, in the right direction there. It just – because I agree – I don't, I don't necessarily think it's all about the Super Bowl. I think it's more about the relationship on the staff that it seemed right. to be uncomfortable and, and, all year. Do you agree? Yeah, because, again, there was a, this discussion where basically, excuse me, Shanahan had to compel Wilkes to come down to the sideline and do it differently. And I don't know if that was ever done comfortably. I know that Wilkes really wanted to stay here. Like, he really liked being in San Francisco, and he didn't – like, he was telling people early on, look, this is – I'm not going to just take another job to take another job. I want to be here for a long time because just getting another, say, head coaching job or another defensive coordinator job with another team that has more money is not – like, that's not the direction he wanted to go. So he felt comfortable here. He wanted to be in San Francisco long term unless he could get to a great, great environment. So I would say that this caught this caught Wilkes by surprise. Um, and they wasn't given another chance. But again, I think to go back to your initial point that this wasn't a, a, a genuine relationship that was, you know, it was sort of pre-made the way that Sala or um or D'Amico Ryans was, or if he had gone, been able to get Fangio to come back a year ago, right? Like that was the initial yeah. talk, get Fangio to come back. Like you can just, you can just take off running with those guys, right? Because you know them, they know you, they know what you're thinking and what you, how you want to play it on defense. I don't think that that was at level of comfort. I'm surprised that he didn't give him another year to get to that level because relationships sometimes take a while. But again, I go back to, I got to believe that Kyle Shanahan made this move with the next move already plotted out. And he's waiting for that to happen. Let me, let me get into the Super Bowl. I mean, not to load the question up, would you make a Super Bowl 58? Oh, I, I thought it was an awesome game. It was fun. I mean, like, there's sloppy play that you can criticize. There are decisions that we can criticize. I thought it was built up drama. That was great drama. Like I this thought, you know, going back and forth and you know, again, big misplays here, big misplays there, lost opportunities there, lost opportunities there, momentum swings this way, momentum swings that way. Again, I thought San Francisco's defensive line was brilliant for three quarters. Absolutely brilliant. Um, the only hiccup is, you know, the touchdown they gave up after the muff punt. Um, but the game should have been 17-6. It should have been 20-6 to at that point in time. It shouldn't have been a as big a dramatic play. But you know what happens. You're a defensive guy. You go out there, you force Patrick Mahomes into another three and out, right? They punt. Now I'm going back, right back out on the field after, you know, punt that we you know, we should have possession. We I should be sitting here getting, you know, getting a breather. And I gotta go back out on the field again in this high drama game. And then, you know, they gave up the touchdown on the very next play. It was not surprising. But the whole game shifted on that one play because San Francisco allowed it to shift on that one play. San Francisco I thought made four critical errors. McCaffrey fumble in in the first half. Um the obviously the muffed punt, um, and not picking the, up the Chris Jones, late Chris in the Jones, game. And, you know, Bur Burford Burford whiffing on that one is is terrible. And then there was one other, and I'm, I'm 
I'm kind of, I'm, I'm not remembering it at the moment. Um, oh, I, I, it'll come to me in a second. I, I wrote it out right after the Super Bowl, but um, you know, there were four critical mistakes that if you change any one of those, I'm not saying you have to change all of them. I'm saying you've changed one of those. Oh, oh it was the, 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 the blocked extra point. Okay, yeah. Oh, if my God. Change, Turned right, out to be if, the difference. Right. The regulation. If you, right. If you change any one of those four, you probably win. Not definitely, but probably win because, you know, the game changes how it plays out and all those other things. Kansas City plays with more urgency. And that's even before you get to the overtime rules thing. And to be quite frank, the the difference between how the overtime is played is only the slightest advantage to having a second. Now, having thought it through in the aftermath, I thought I'd take the ball first, but I hadn't thought about the two-pointer, which will be a gutsy play at the, at, in the second position. But that tips the scales for me. But, like, there are people who have done The reason I think he took it is because they were just went on an 11-play drive on defense and regulation, and I think some of that had to that be in. I thought that defense was gassed at the end of the game because they were gassed in the overtime frame. They went up. Well, they yeah, went they, up well, the field sure. on them. I, I understand that. I'm not. I, I'm not disputing that. You know, look, losing Drake Greenlaw was a huge thing for them. Huge. Right. So a lot of things went against the 49ers in this game. Not so many that you say, oh, you know, they obviously, you know. They obviously lost a game they should have won. You can make that argument. And that was pretty evenly played. I thought that San Francisco overall played better. But just playing better is not enough when the quarterback on the other side is Patrick Mahomes. It's that you you have to you have to you have to hammer on them. How about this, Jace? Do you look at Mahomes different now with three than with two? I mean I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not comparing him yet to anyone because we, now we're starting to talk about Bradshaw and Matana and, you know, just postseason Super Bowl wins and, of course, Brady and Aikman and these guys. But do you see him different because of all those guys I just mentioned, he's the most talented quarterback of any one of those guys when it comes to physical assets and physical skills. I'm not saying he's the better quarterback – and processor of information on the field yet because those other guys have done more. Joe, in my opinion, is hard to beat that guy, and I'm, I have a hard time always saying even Brady is better than that guy. How do you look at him? Well, I mean, he's stepped up into, you know, the top five or six quarterbacks of all time, right? That's crazy. I, mean, I right, agree. Like, yep. I mean, you know, how do you want <laughs> – excuse me. I always look at the question when people say, name your top five or top six or top eight or whatever number you want to put on it, right? I always kind of laugh about the question and go, look, you put them in any order that you want. I don't okay. care. But if we're choosing up sides for, for teams, I'll take the last pick. Yeah. And I'll be okay. Right? Yeah, you like, can have Brady. I'll take Montana. Yeah, right. Or whatever you want. You want Bradshaw? I'll go all the way. You want, you know, yeah. whatever you want to do, right? I don't care. You know, like they're all great. All now, great desserts, right? Oh, geez, main course. It's a, it's a, it's a five course meal, man. With all yep. those guys, it's a, it's an amazing thing with all of them, right? Yeah, they play differently. You know, Elway's different from Brady, who's different from Montana, who's different from Mahomes. I mean, yes, Mahomes is probably the best. You know, he's right there with Elway. Elway's yeah. probably got a little stronger arm. Maybe um, Young. And Young's arm is is wasn't that strong. But, but his athleticism but, is off the charts. But the, athletic, but the athleticism combined with an arm that's close to Elway yep. and the ability to throw off-platform. And you talk about processing of information. I mean, what, one interception in his last eight playoff games, some crazy number like that? Crazy. crazy. And we saw it, right? Like, okay, he forced a ball. One time in eight games, he's forced a ball. <laughs> he's better in the playoffs than he is during the regular season. Like, that's that's all-timer kind of stuff, right? Like, that's 
why Terrell Davis was a Hall of Famer because he was better in the postseason than he was during the regular season. And he was great during the regular season. And now he's doing it over an expanded period of time. Like, he's just, he's an amazing player. He's 28 years old or whatever he is. 27, I can't, you know, can't remember. I think he's 27. Right. Like, we're watching something that's truly magnificent. And that has a chance you know, to be the greatest of all time. Do you have a different opinion now of Mike Shanahan, or excuse me, Kyle Shanahan? No, I still think he's a great coach. But I, I, I have he's he is a um, tragic character. You like think he's was, more like Andy Reid was in Philly, and that he's like Andy completely is a different guy now, and that here you have Kyle. Learning how to win that game. He knows how to win because he's won. But now he's right. learning how to try to win. And you got to remember, too, Jace, just like when you're in the era of Jordan or you're in the era of Tiger or you're in the era of, you know, Mahomes, you know, I mean, people forget who you're going to. I mean, Manning is a great quarterback. He's in the Brady era. I mean, Mickelson and Tiger. Mickelson was great. Mickelson was never the number one ranked golfer in the world. Because why? Well, that guy over there was. I right. mean, is that what we're looking at here with, with 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 Kyle Shanahan? Kind of. And I think that's an interesting <clears> – <throat> when you brought up Reed in Philly, it's an interesting comparison. Um, because Andy was much more defensive. Um, and, you know, I, I never – argumentative but he would and some of it is you know being in philly that's philly is much more of an in-your-face fan base and a media group than say kansas city right yeah so and he had to be a little bit more on guard and he was experimenting with a lot of ideas about how you run your offense and what you do and all these other things right and clock management was terrible and things like that um and Kyle is sort of in the same stage. He's, um, and yeah, he's come up against some guys who are just, you know, he's, he's lost two Super Bowls to Mahomes. Like, there's no shame in that. None. And and, the, and and his record is amazing. And when people say, oh, fire Kyle Shanahan, I just look and go, like, what, where do we start drug testing you? Like, you know, yes, he's made his mistakes. He picked Trey Lance. You want to get on his case? Fine. He lost two Super Bowls. He's lost a couple of NFC Championship games. He got there. Like, you want to go back to Jim Tom Sula? Really? No, no, you want no. to go back to Jim Kelly? Like, you really I'm, I'm want to see, I yeah, look at it different than most people because some, you know, folks look at it like this. And I think and I hope, and I'm not speaking for you, someone goes like this Dan, what do you think of Marv Levy? That anybody who wins four AFC championship games in a row, that's something you'll never see in your entire life. Did he right. lose those four? Yes. However, when you do something that's one of, and that'll never happen again, you 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 have to put everything in proper context on what, like, like Bud Grant and what Bud brought to the Minnesota Vikings that no coach has brought since, including Dennis Green where an opportunity to always be around the rim, as Jerry Jones likes to say. I mean, you're always going to be around the rim. Sometimes it just doesn't go in, right, when you're one of these guys. You're lucky if you get one, right, Chase? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, like, I'm not going to sit here and go, Tom Flores is a better coach because he's got two Super Bowls than Marv Levy. I'm, I'm, I, I'm just not going to say that. Or George Seifert. You know, George Seifert is not a better coach because he won back-to-back -back Super Bowls. I was, I saw yeah. George Seifert. I mean, was, seriously, you think that guy's better than Bud Grant? I, I don't think that guy's better than Bud Grant. No, and I and look, I just, I, I, I saw these guys. I saw these guys work. I saw what what they were doing. And Kyle Shanahan is genius. Now, he's at a, a precipice that he had to be very aware of because he's got a team that could age out quickly, right? Like. Debo's not a guy who's going to have a long career, I don't think. Not playing that way. Brandon Ayuk, you know, do you keep him? Do you not keep him? George Kittle, his body's been banged a lot. 
use check is is getting long in the tooth. How long does McCaffrey last? Okay, you got Purdy, but you know with Purdy, a in a year you're going to have to pay him, and and you know a you're going to have to pay him in a year. B, you know that he requires having guys around him, yeah, to make him better. So you have to work massage how it's going to work. You've got a great defense that you paid. You got both, uh, you know, on the first year's contract. Hargraves on his first year of his contract. Armstead, you're going to let Chase Young go because he was just a guy. But you still got Ken Law and some other guys. Like the defense is, the de- it's probably going to transition to being a little bit more of a defensive team here in the next year or two. But can you get enough out of your offense to get you back to the Super Bowl for another run as you prepare for how are you going to replace some of these guys? Jason, Jason, can you can you talk a little bit about the Hall of Fame here? Are you okay? Sure. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, because we're based in Philly, I have to ask you out of the gate, did the process get close for Eric Allen this time? Was he debated? Was he not? Was it a was quick debated, conversation? Debated. I think it was an overall positive, strong conversation. You know, he's just, it, it's the first or second time in the room. I can't remember how many times he's been in the room. You know, there has to be momentum built. It's sort of the long lines of a, of a Fred Taylor or a Willie Anderson or a, you know, some of these other guys. They're not, they're not the guys who've been there right away, and they're not guys who, in the first year, you're like, yeah, like Julius Peppers. Julius Peppers, like, you know, that that's that's a strong that's a yes. strong candidate. Yes. Or he's not in a position where there is a backlog, like wide receiver or defensive end. You know, we got two defensive end this year and one wide receiver. But you know, we've been arguing about Tory Holt, and Andre Johnson, and Reggie Wayne for a long time, right? A long time we've been fighting about those guys, and it's like. We had, you know, and I'm not saying that there was any collusion or anything like that, but it was just like, look, let's make a breakthrough and get these guys through because they all deserve to be in. And I think so Eric, Reggie's in Reggie, Reggie's in that conversation now where dude, if you're being brought up every year, it's gonna happen for you because the repetitive conversation, you know, it's gonna is that how it works sometimes, Jason? Wait. It just takes one or two votes and it swings well, yeah, the entire I mean, I room. Got, Remember we, we had that group of offensive linemen with Hutchinson, Fanica, uh, Baselli, and Mawai. And one year we couldn't get any of them in. We couldn't figure it out, right? And finally there was like this push of, okay, Mawai. And Mawai made it. And then the next, I think it was Hutchinson next, or and then Fanica next, and then finally Baselli. And it took four years to get those guys through, but we did it, right? And again, that's not planned out in advance. I don't want to say that's how it, but that's how that's how it fell. Those were how the dominoes fell. So the dominoes are kind of falling the same way with defensive ends or wide receivers right now. And then you're kind of like sitting here going, okay, who are some other guys? And they were there. You know, Antonio Gates was a very difficult discussion. Okay. The fact I was that pretty he didn't shocked he it. didn't get in. I was shocked too, but you know, the people brought up the PED suspension. Um, and, and I've you know, forgotten like, that. Right. So, so there's that. And there were other candidates who are really great. Like Julius Pepper is really great. Free, you know, when I did my survey, you're aware of my survey. Antonio Gates was number one. So I went yeah. into that yeah. thinking Gates is going to get in. Pretty strong candidate. Got better support than Joe Thomas. Got better support. Yep. Uh, than Darrell Revis the year before. Um, but it turned out that I think that the PD suspension worked against him, at least for a year. And then it was the next five guys who got in. I I, I, I think you can't put him in on a first ballot, but it's going to take a few. But he, he he's going to land on that. How hard was it for Devin Hester, that conversation, because he doesn't have, and we talked about this last week, but being in the room when you're actually debating it, this guy never had a position, Chase, but yet he had massive impact in the league. And he was an impact player, but without a position. That must have been the weirdest thing to talk about somebody. What does he do great? He doesn't really do anything NFL outside of being 
the best special teams guy of all time. That was it, right? Well, that was it. But this, I mean, the, the fortunate part with, with Hester is we'd had the, the, a discussion the previous two years. Right. And we got through the whole thing. Like, you know, like you can never play DB, you can never play wide receiver. You know him from UM, right? Like, yep. he, he couldn't do it, right? He wasn't, he, we couldn't find a spot for him there. Right. And so you sit there and go, like, you know, he's a flaw, he's a flawed as an overall football player. But then you just sit back and you go, I mean, God I know. Damn, like, like, you, like, every single time there's a kicker punt return, he was back there. You did not leave your seat. They changed right? the you, rules because of him. You're right, right. You did not go anywhere, right? And you just said, I got to watch that dude. And there's a certain point where you just have to say, stats be damned and all this other stuff be damned. That's a great freaking player. And when he's on the field, like, it's electric. And it's on, and you got you have to watch, and that's kind of like how do you define fame? You know, we sit here with a thousand different things that we talk about. You know, stats, and you know, impact, and you know, championships, and you know, legacy. You know, all these things that are ill-defined. We're just trying to find to find the fame, most famous players in the game, and and. Devin Hester is one of the most famous guys and a guy that you, whenever he was had the ball in his hand, you were like, dude, I got to watch this. I always look at it like this, Jason. Can you write the history of the league without that guy in it? I think you have to be part of the history of the game because, look, I don't think – see, to me, a guy like – um can I can guy? I just say one? Can I can I say one thing about the, that that and I've heard that before many times, and I'm not saying it's a completely illegitimate argument, but I always have this joke in my head when people say you can't write the history of X without this person's name. I'm like, yeah, you can't write the history of the world without writing about Adolf Hitler. He ain't making any Hall of Fames, okay? <laughs> you know. So we're not, I mean, I know this is a completely different discussion. No, we're talking, about, but he did impact the world. Right. And yeah, and so I don't know that having an impact on, like, you can't write about the history of the game without writing about some negative people, right? Uh, yep, who, don't yep. belong, who don't belong, who don't belong in the hall. And we can get into who they are and stuff. So that standard is a little, it, it, I, I'm uncomfortable with that standard. Okay. But the bottom, but the bottom line is, it's a, there's a good point to it, and that is, thirty years, forty years from now, fifty years from now, people who lived in this era are going to sit there and go, "Oh yeah, you think that guy's a good return guy? You should have seen Devin Hester." Yep. Just like when I talk to people about basketball who are under the age of forty, and they talk about this guy, LeBron, and this, and I go, "Did you ever see Wilt Chamberlain?" Uh, you, you you probably think he couldn't play today. I do. You, you I mean, I do. I do think he could. I mean, the guy the guy was the guy was a track star. He was a yeah. deca you know decathlete. He was he was amazing as a hurdler at seven feet. And there ain't too He's many centers most, in the league right now. Okay, yeah, like Will Chamberlain could walk on the floor right now if he was alive in, in his prime, and he would be a dominant force. He would have been, you know, and and people don't, you know, people there there are a few freaks of nature of the past. You think and LT Devin can Hester, play in today's NFL? What? You think LT and Reggie White can play in today's NFL? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, those, yes, yeah, he, he had the size, and, and LT he had the quickness. I mean, like those guys can walk on the field and play. Right now, I'm not saying everybody can. Yep, I agree. But there are some outliers. There are freaks of nature out there who, in, in any era, you know, it gets harder for some other guys. You know, like Bill Russell in today's NBA. I don't see it. I, don't, I think it's I, Draymond I, I, Green. A bigger version of it, but yep. but yeah, like he's not the same player. He might win a lot still because he's a you know he's a smart player, but it's not the same thing as when it was what 12, 14 team league. And he was the second most dominant big man in, in, in the league. 
uh, I just, you know, I don't think he could generate those kind of numbers. Wilt could generate numbers. Maybe not 50 a game, but generate numbers. Um, Andre Johnson, that must have been – Andre, here, I'll tell you something. He watched the show when, you know, you were on, and he texted me, and then he called me, and he goes, because what do you think? You talked to Jared and all these guys, Jared Bell and all these guys, and and I said, and I go, here's what I think. When they talk about you, they have to talk about TJ Yates. They have to talk about some of the worst quarterbacks in the history of the league that you put up those insane numbers with. I say this to you, and I told him this. There's very few people that are as giftedly talented as you skill-wise. Moss, Megatron, guys like that. You're in that conversation, guy. I think he's I, – I, I, I think he did more with crappy quarterbacks or as much as crappy quarterbacks as Owens did. Um, I look, you're getting no dispute from me. I mean, I, look, you put Torrey Holt, Reggie Wayne, and Andre Johnson in front of me. And, yes, we can argue about the resumes, that they're incredibly similar, which they are. They are. We can, we can argue about who won a Super Bowl versus who did, who played with great quarterbacks, who didn't, who played in the offensive systems. And all that. But if you just look at those dudes, you go, I'm picking him. Yeah. <laughs> Give me that dude. He's six foot four, six foot five. He's a beast of a human being. He's gonna he's gonna dominate the game, right? And that's not a great standard, but when all everything things are equal. There's a certain point where you go, there, the eye test doesn't lie. Like the eye test is, and I saw that kid play in college. I saw him play in the pros. And, again, you're like, that's as dominant a wide receiver as you can ever imagine. And that, that that's not meant as a slight at Reggie or Torrey, who had phenomenal careers. But there's a process when you do personnel in this league. And when – you know, when they're that gifted, you just go, that dude. Yep. And if there wasn't a Megatron, Andre would be Megatron. Yeah. Just like Julio Jones was the next iteration of those guys, right? Yeah. He's the next iteration of Andre, T.O., not quite Megatron. Megatron's a little bit different than those guys because of just the vast size. But the big dominant receivers who are going to just overwhelm defenses – and who you simply cannot take away. No matter how bad the quarterback is, no matter how good the defense is, you can't take those dudes away because they're just too good. Okay, finally. Um, I want to take you out of that room and into the last room here. I know you're friends with Jared Bell. He had an interesting column in USA Today. He's a voter like you. What'd you make of that whole thing on the sidelines with Andy Reid and with Travis Kelsey? And, you know, he, he he took it to a place. I'm not saying he's wrong. I think winning covers a lot of things, Jace. And he even addressed it on his podcast with his brother. And his brother kind of got in his ass a little bit, too, also, in that, that, that show that the both of them do. But just as a guy covering the sport, what would you make of that thing in the biggest moment? Well, in, uh, I, don't, I don't know what Jared wrote. I, I'm gonna well, Jared, Jared thinks that if that was – um, a black wide receiver, or if that was any African American wide receiver, it would be looked at like if that was T.O. or if that was. Okay, um, wait, let's stop. Let's stop for a second. If it was Patrick Mahomes who had done it, how would it be viewed? I don't know. I mean, I mean, we can we can suggest a lot of things, um, and I'm not saying that Jared's wrong. Okay, he may be completely and totally right. Um, I will say this. I think that Andy Reid handled it perfectly um, by not blowing up. And I liken the way that he handled it to the way that um, Phil Jackson handled Scottie Pippen when Scottie Pippen took himself out of the game. At the you know, the, the one of the, the first year without, the Kukoc without shot. yeah, the, when they designed the play for Kukoc, coach and he took himself out of the game and said he didn't want you know didn't want to be in on the play, and everybody ripped him 
and Reed, I mean, and I'm not Reed, but Jackson didn't say anything about it. Other than he brought him in the office and said, look, I'm not going to get in your ass. Um, I'm not going to get get on you. The media is going to do that to you. And you have to face up that this is the choice that you made. And I think Reed handled it the same way. Um, to me, look, it's not professional. There's no question. I mean, Travis Kelsey was not professional. And he's admitted that. He's realized it. His brother got on his ass for the right reason. And it's the kind of thing that you only get away with in the heat of the moment but once. If you're a great player. And I think that there's probably plenty of great black players who had, if they had the same resume as Kelsey in the same, you know, history would probably get away with it, but you only get away with it once. And would they have gotten ripped harder than Kelsey? Maybe, maybe it would have happened. I don't know. Um, but it's certainly a legitimate question to ask. And you know, the bottom line is that Kelsey was wrong. But I'm not going to go any further because he's admitted it. Yeah, right? no, he I, I listened yeah. to his, you know, his brother really got in his ass. I mean, they, that that show they do, and he's like completely out of hand, can't be doing that. And we had to remember something. Jason has a great relationship with Andy too, because he drafted him and right. Philly. So I mean, there's a relationship between both brothers. And so, you know, he, he was looking at his brother and he goes, bad look, dude, bad look. And you, you and you knew it wasn't anything that they were playing good cop, bad cop. I don't believe that at all. I think it was two brothers just going like this. And then, and then you know, even, even Travis Kelsey said, hey, man, you know, it, it was totally my mistake. I, 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 before mm -hmm. I get out of here, that the tragedy in Kansas City, do you think that the NFL will now relook about um, putting these parades on? and having the celebrations now just in confined stadiums and environments because, I mean, they had 800 cops, Jace. You can't do anything about a maniac in a room. There's not going to be any gun law changes. We know this right. through our history. It's not happening. Whatever political party you're in, you're affiliated with, it's not changing. But do you think the NFL does something to put these things in more secure locations because – I don't know what Kansas City could have did. They had 800 cops, and the maniac still uh, got in I, there and did that. You, you're not you're not stopping that. No, you're not. It's sad because it took away right. something. Completely, that, it's awful. It's say it's it, it's taken away something. I mean, primarily, look, eight kids, kids are, Chase. Yeah, kids are hurt or dead, and a mom right? lost her life. I mean, right. the people, yeah, you know, like that, that that you just start there, and so you know. What are we going to do with it? And I'm not just, it's not just the NFL, but Major League Baseball, the, the NHL, the NBA. You can't, you can't, you can't do this anymore, right? No, like, I, I don't, yeah, I, I, mean, I, there, there's a reason, I, Jason, we have now gates up around schools. And I think now yeah. we're going to have to do, I get this, this is not about protecting the Chiefs, this is about protecting normal American citizens. Right. So it's not just about Mahomes. It's about the citizens that go into um, Arrowhead Stadium. These are the people that celebrate, buy the banners, have a great time, civic pride. I mean, these NFL teams have become – like in Philadelphia, I'll tell you something, Jason. That Philadelphia Eagle team, man, I'll tell you, that thing is a civic pride team. It These guys can't separate that thing from anything else. And when they win – just like in Buffalo with the Bills Mafia. I just think the NFL maybe in sports has to just protect these people more and hold these things, unfortunately, in situations where, like, you bring everybody in a stadium and you celebrate that way where you have a controlled environment because I don't know what else you can do because, like I said, Kansas City had 800 cops. Now, I don't care what the NFL does. You, you're not stopping that. Well, no, I mean, you could have, you could have 2,000 cops. Yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't have mattered. Matter. It wouldn't matter. I mean, I don't know what the total crowd size was, but, I mean, some of these crowd sizes get into, you know, five, six, seven hundred thousand, you know, maybe a million people. So, yeah, you're not, it doesn't matter if you have 2,000, 800, 2,000, or 5,000 cops. They're just outnumbered, right? And, 
And even if they're there, you're not going to stop somebody if they really want to come in and do damage. So yeah, the sadly, the parade, the the parade is now something that may become extinct. And it's, you know, it just sucks. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. It, it, because the whole point, yeah, of, of the whole point of being a yeah. fan and having a team doing this is that all these people, right? All these people who we all know, uh, those hundreds of thousands of people. Most of the time, you can't get those people together to do anything, right? Together. Right, you can't get them to go to a political rally. You can't get them to agree to anything. You can't get them to go to a school board meeting. You can't get them to do this. But if the Chiefs win, or the Eagles win, or the Rams, or the 49 or whoever it is, like, can you imagine the parade they would have in Detroit if the Lions win? Holy, right? you're right. talking two million people. Right. If you had that, you would have just this, and you would have all these people come together and just be happy. Which is the whole freaking point of people sharing some joy and looking at each other going, yeah, you're black or you're Latino or you're white, you're Chinese, you're whatever, but we're fans. You're gay, straight, whatever it happens to be, but we're all fans. Yeah. And for today, today, we can all be freaking happy. How about this, right? Jason? I tell people this, it's the only place on the planet in our country or in our country where Republicans, Democrats, Jews, Gentiles, Catholics, Protestants, whoever, whatever your political, religious, philo philosophical thinking is, it's the only place where you could sit next to one another and say this, hey, go Eagles. Right, guy? Right. And it's really the last bastion where you can walk into a stadium and that doesn't matter because every other place, you know, if you know where you are, you're not sitting next to that guy. That guy's a Biden or a Trump guy or this and that politics divides us. Now religion at times divides us. Sports mm -hmm. brings us. It's the last thing that brings us together. Right. And so now this amazing moment to have all those people come, come place, uh, come and celebrate. Yeah. It's probably over. In a place like Kansas over. City, too, right, Jace? Yeah. Middle of America, the Hunt family. Well, I mean, you could, it's it so historic. It's, it's it's anywhere, dude. You know that. You yeah. know that. It's Absolutely. anywhere. I mean, some places more than others, but it's anywhere because, like, I, I, I gave up on arguing with people about guns a long time ago. But there's a lot of guns out there, man. Right. And it, it doesn't matter where it is. There's just a lot of guns hey, and a lot of not, weapons. Not, lot not of to get not to get historical on you, but and I you know, people go, How do you feel about it? I go, the United States in this country, the guns you would only be taking away from law abiding citizens. You think the bad guys are not gonna have them? I said the problem that you have is 1865, when the Civil War was over, every American had a gun. Well, that day forever changed America's landscape. And it's never been different. You'll never change it. There'll always be guns in this country. Good people, bad people. It's just not going to change. So right. all the talk you do, it's not going to change it. And that's why you get a maniac at one of those places like that. And I get it. Now, look, do I think America is but, 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 right? But, but, right. but here's the, the flip side. And I mean, don't mean to interrupt you, but it's just like you end up having a smaller world as a result of it. That's right. Where you end up and, and and you end up having people freaked out, and that's why we're not going to have the parade because that's stupid because people. For one guy for ruins just, the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. One guy who couldn't control it for a day, a guy you know, or two guys, whatever it was. I, I you know, those guys for a day, like they couldn't just sit there and go, "Hey, not today, man, not today." Right. I I, like I that, thought yeah. those those three, I thought those three cheese fans tackling that guy. Yeah. I was like this, man. Hey, I don't know about you, man, but those are citizens of the year. I mean, that was that was yeah, just yeah. that shows you what a crazy fan base you can have when a guy has an AK forty seven or whatever it is, and this guy's taking him down with a banner. I mean, Jason, that's a Chiefs fan. Yeah. That's a that's a that's a hero. 
Okay. It is a it hero. Prevented other people from getting hurt. But That's I'm just right. sitting here going, you got, you're bringing an AK-47 to a parade. Yeah, what's wrong like, with well, you, man? What, what's wrong with you, man? Yeah. Like, what, 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 I mean, well, like, I, have you, can, you can have the gun. I'm not going to stop you. But why would you have it? Where, well, you can have it. I mean, what I'm saying is legally, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to be one of those people saying you can't own it. But why are you bringing it to a parade? Like today. <laughs> be wide what are you doing? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Just you stay doing? home, man. Stay. Like, if you can't, If you can't leave the house without that to go have a good time in a parade, don't go. Dude, just don't go. Stay at home, man. Just stop. Right. Just, hey, just lock stop. yourself in a room with no lights on. Just go away, guy, because that's not what we're here for. Jason, it's been great, my friend. You know the great thing yep. about the NFL, too? See, the NFL is the only sport, Jason, that knows what a sports calendar looks like. They have free agency. They have the combines. Then they have the draft. Then they have OTAs. Then they have mini camp, then they have training camp, and in September we're dropping a banner. These I other mean, sports, let, let me ask these you other something. sports have no idea what they're doing. How many national holidays does the NFL have? The draft, <laughs> the Super free, Bowl, oh, free agency, free agents. Oh, geez, free agency. First, first day of free agency. For the opening of the NFL weekend. Right. Okay. Let's see what else. Yeah. yeah. Tone, tone is saying. Tone is saying the combine. Combines. The combines. Good yeah. How many times? More. How many TV <laughs> shows? How many lingerie shows? Do you see? Get sixty million people going. Hey Dan, turn to the right. Exactly. Dan, turn to the left. <laughs> Dan, run, run a forty. Run Dan, a 40. run a forty. And look, like, look at that guy in from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Can you believe it? That guy from Slippery Rock University, I can't believe it. I hope we get him in the seventh. You're like, dude, really? Are you smoking crack? From no like Wisconsin? What the hell's wrong with you, man? I, the NFL has a market on that thing, man. man. They have so they have like five, six, seven national holidays, man. It's just it's craziness. And it's I mean it's it's wonderful. It's a joy, but it's it's just craziness. Um, it is absolutely, absolutely. I mean, they have two Christmases: free agency and the draft. That's Christmas, because absolutely. all you all you fans who didn't make the Super Bowl, your team didn't make it. You still get to unwrap a present on the first day of free agency and on the first day of the draft. You need a new toy to look at. So you, you mean you, we can just, win the Super? Oh my God, free agency! And what they do is it's on. What, what, two, Jason, 202 million people on all platforms watch that uh-huh. Super Bowl. That must tell you a lot about – I mean, you know, people do this in sports broadcasting, Jace. They go like this. Well, you know, it's time that I'll talk about NHL or NBA. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. The 200 – half a billion people. You know there's only 350 million people that live in America. 202 of them watched them on all platforms. Come on now, Jace. 120 million on CBS I'm alone. Not, I'm, I'm not I'm not disputing it at all. And, and this and was the first year without Brady. Your biggest star in the sport left. And the ratings went up 14% across the board all year. Come on, yes. man. That's a that's met when Jordan left, tank. When Tiger left the PGA, tank. When George, I'm saying when LJ, LBJ leaves, tank. I mean, when Brady leaves, the league expands in ratings. I think it's incredibly and insane. I got to leave you with this. Do you think Taylor Swift had any impact on that Super Bowl when it came to viewership? Maybe a little. I mean, sure. Were there girls watching that Super Bowl who wouldn't otherwise watch? Were there teenage girls watching that game? Yes. That's all you need to know. I saw Roger that. Goodell go over and I went and I, I told people, I go, you think Goodell goes over and talks to anybody? Goodell's working her for next year to do a halftime show. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> hey, 
Yeah. <laughs> Kansas City gets hey, back hey, on a repeat. Oh, that, but and, and can you imagine all the all the people who are going to believe that the Chiefs are set up to win it again next year? All the all the crazy people who think that like the 49ers laid down so that the Chiefs can win it. Have Taylor and have Taylor on the field after the game, like those the the nut bags who believe that stuff. If Andy Reid wins three in a row with Mahomes, does that achievement is that better than six? Three in a row, he'll have four total. But wouldn't that when you go like this, the only guy to do that and the last guy to do that is Lombardi. Two Super Bowls and one NFL title. Yeah, I would I would say this about Belichick. There's six plus two. Well, he's got three now. No, but say, but but he's six plus he's got two more as a coordinator. Oh yeah, with the uh coordinators in New York. Yeah, he's got eight. So so Belichick has spent yeah. a lot of his life in the Super Bowl. You know what I'm saying? Um, Was Andy on that staff up in Green Bay when uh, when Holmgren won? Uh, you know, I, th- I don't know. It's a good question. I thought he'd already left. Okay. Was what, what, what was McNabb's rookie year? Like 2001? Two? That, is it that late? Wait a sec. What's McNabb's? Was he, what, what, yeah, what, because he was the quarterback coach up there for Favre. 99 right. was McNabb's first year. So, yeah, ninety-seven. Yeah, he, he was, yeah, he was on the staff. So he was on. Three. He was on that staff in uh, Green yeah. Bay. So he's got four. It's a it's, it's it's a fascinating discussion. It might be the greatest achievement in football history. In the it, Super Bowl era, or in was, history, I would say it's bigger than it, like the Super Bowl era is bigger than anything that came before it. Right, I mean, you know, the game was great. You know, I'm not trying to dispute it, but three straight Super Bowls in a league with 32 teams. I mean, I, when Lambeau won three straight at one point, you yep. know, back when it was really like Really, Lambeau won teams. three straight, and Lombardi was the last to do it. And obviously, Levy won. Well, yeah, because he won an NFL championship. He won the NFL yep. championship, yes. Um, I just think it's a different level of achievement. It's just a different – it's a different competitive game. Not – I'm not trying to take anything away from those other guys, but this is just a harder thing to do. It's just the pure numbers of it, the competitiveness of it. That you know, it, it might be the greatest coaching achievement of all time. Does that make him the greatest coach of all time? Pretty good argument for it. Okay, if he wins three Super Bowls in a row, Shula did this. He went to three straight, won two. One of those teams was undefeated. Would you still put the three Pete ahead of that? Probably because you got win. I no no. I I think you're right. I think even against, you see, when someone asks me the greatest team of all time, it's the Dolphin team, because the Dolphins went to three straight AFC titles, won it, two Super Bowls, and one of those teams happened to be the last undefeated team in history. Yeah. So it's a, I mean, it's a. I will say, you know, the era of football you're talking about is a very different game, but the league was big. Yeah, because you kept all the players, which means I think the league was stronger, not as talented as the guys are today. However, they were more right. coached up to be more skillful as anything we see because, I mean, a no, lot of the guys well, stayed in one place for 10 years. Right, but also uh, they were also more limited by roster size. Like you have forty man rosters. I thought it was thirty seven back then. It might be forty. I can't remember. You know, it it it, it goes between thirty five and forty something. I thought it, I thought it was so, like forty seven. Was when I right. Played so, it. but remember, you just you didn't in the seventies. A, you didn't have the passing the rules that you have now. So it's a very different game and a very wide open. But hey, the, you but want to hear something just, crazy? You have, oh, 50, just you have 57 now, yeah. and you're expanding it now that since the new year is going to start on March, they're expanding it now with 20 practice players. So almost, get this, almost 97 players are now going to be on NFL rosters that, like when I played, only 47 would be on the team. So you got almost 90 guys now. 
that could, or right. or seventy eight, almost eighty guys now could be on a team. But just in re, in in regular season, the thing that people the the thing that people don't understand about the value of expanded rosters between the forty when they were in the forties to now fifty three on game day is. Nickelbacks and Nick and and fifth receivers and dime receivers and stuff like that, they didn't exist in this in the sixties and seventies. Like the 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 you know the four wide formations, the five wide formations that you see a lot right now, they couldn't exist because you didn't have guys who could play there. Yeah, you can take your running backs and you theoretically could you know push them out there, but they were running backs. They weren't. I'm going to bring in. You know, Oz Akeem, right? And yep. have him play my fourth receiver, you know, or third, depending on what, how I want to use Ricky Kroll, right? Um, or, you know, any of these other teams. So that, that just didn't exist in the NFL that day. So today's NFL, it's a more complicated game with, you know, with more sets. I would say that Reed's accomplishment will be, if, if they get there, it's a big if, obviously. Um, Man, I, I, that'd be awesome to see. It'd be really awesome. Because think about this. We would go straight from the Brady era, yeah, Brady and Belichick era, and without even a hesitation, without even like five or ten years to just say, oh, we really need to appreciate that because that'll never exist again. We're going to go straight into, boom, here it comes. Like there was a period between the end of the Walsh the Walsh 49ers, basically, you know, when they won the five titles, even with the two with Seifert, there was like a good five-year period before we ignited the the Patriot era. Even a Steeler run of four and six, there was a law after that, you know I mean? There wasn't a team dominating yeah. and putting out, like you said, it took some time for teams to get, I mean, crap, I would make the argument that after the Steelers and once you got maybe the Redskins – back then when they were called that because of the three they won there. Then the 49ers came up in the 80s, and that's when the Niners under Walsh and McVay and um, Eddie and then Policy, probably that one came up. And then after that was probably the Cowboy one with Jimmy and uh, Barry and then Belichick. Jimmy and Barry, Jimmy and Barry really were the last. You know, that, that group only lasts four of that four years. And they won three and four. They won three and four, but they were, you know, they were toast. Yeah, ninety-six. Like they went, they they went like that, and they were beaten up. There was reasons for that, but between that, because again, the the Forty Niners win one in ninety-four, and you know, and the and the and the and the Cowboys drop off. Green Bay becomes good for a couple of years, that kind of thing, and Denver has the back-to-back titles, but nobody goes on this elongated 10, 15, 20 year run. The way the 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 Forty Niners won a fifteen year run. Then we went to the Patriots, you know, this period with their run. And now all of a sudden we just went from the Patriots to it's Kansas City. And where are they going? Like Reed is what? 66. 60, he's 66. If he coaches another five years, does he break Bell does he break Shula's record? Probably. So get right, this because he has four titles. If he has four NFL championships, four Super Bowls, and the all-time regular season and the postseason, I think he's at 23 postseason wins with the Super Bowl. So yeah. he's nine away or 35. I think Belichick has 35 or 36 postseason wins. He could easily catch that. He could because he's got the quarterback, just like Belichick had the quarterback, right? If you got the quarterback, you ain't going nowhere anytime soon. I want to sneak one more in on you here. Did you happen to watch You're Looking Live with CBS? Did you see that thing with the um, NFL today with Musburger? No, I did, I did not. Uh, I, w- w- what do you think about Brent getting um, – and there's a lot of push to get Brent Musburger into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I think there's like a, a media award that they can – that he can win to get into. I mean, he deserves, he probably, he's up there. He deserves honor, honor in that broadcast area. Sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, Could that I NFL would, Today show was really like because it was Phyllis George. It yeah. was, you know, um, Jimmy the Greek. Jimmy the Greek. Jimmy, Jimmy the Greek. It was the first Jimmy. time, if you think about it, right? 
It was the first time that they went and talked about gambling on a pregame show. And this was the 70s and early 80s that they were Welcome talking back. about it. And get this from what was on this documentary, which was spectacular, how they got away with it. Greek came up with check marks. And he came up with check marks on what the spread was because Roselle, as they were leaving, they couldn't believe Roselle went like this. Okay, to NB and uh, CBS executives, they could not believe that they went okay. But good, uh, but Roselle said on the way out, just do me a favor, don't say on the air how many points you think that team should win by. They went, oh, that's the whole essence of point spreads. So Greek came up with check marks, and right. Jimmy the Greek goes like this: this four check marks for this team versus the Cowboys, and the four they get the four check marks, and that's right. how it was four points that this team's favored by. All right, look, my that was clever. I always just laugh about Jimmy because I always laugh about you would see him at halftime when it wasn't going very well. And the sweat would be there, and he, you know, like he'd be ready to hit the table because, like, you knew he had a lot of money out there to that day, and it wasn't going well. Anyways, I gotta roll, my man. You got I'll you, man. You I appreciate it, Jace. Thank you so Thanks much, time. my friend. All right, be good. You got it, my friend, Jason Cole. Absolutely, we could talk forever. Pro football. Do me a favor, please hit the like button. Keep it here on the National Football Show. Go for the pulse and the pools. Go for the ooze and the oz. Go for the bubbles and the bubbly. Go for the story and the stories. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday. Watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Sales National Football Show. We appreciate you coming aboard. Thank you so much. Um, let me get on topic again here.
not only is the football team, and I'm talking Eagles, I have a lot to do and a lot of work to do. Let's ask, let's ask the one question here. Okay, hey, Tone, thank you so much, man. Yeah, that was that was great stuff talking with um with with Jason. I appreciate that. And and for the record, Tone dug up some uh roster size stuff. Over time, teams' roster sizes grew, albeit the trend teams went from 16 active list players available to play in every game from 25 to 30 to beginning of the league in 25 by 38 and 40 by 64. Whew. Only 40 dudes made a team in 1964. Since 2011 season, each team can identify 46 active and seven inactive players before each game. Okay. It sounds right, but now you get a practice squad of 19 players. So you would basically, in essence, have 20 guys that make an additional 20 guys that make a roster. So in my day, you didn't have that practice roster. You only had the 46. So there were 46, okay, on 10 teams, you only had 460 players that were in the league. You couldn't hide them or there was, you know, you couldn't hide them. You, you just couldn't hide players. So making a club back in them days, nowadays with the practice roster, shit, 70 guys almost can make a team. I mean, I don't know. And especially when I was the last player cut in my last three stops, I was the last player cut. I'm making those teams with 70 and not just 46, okay? I'm making that team, all right? Those guys didn't make a lot of money, and you didn't get a roster spot. I'll tell you that, man. All right, let me go to this here. Sirianni's got a lot of work to do this coming season. And I mean Sirianni has a lot of work to do. Let's ask the most important question. Can he save his job? Can Nick save his job? Here, I'll give you examples. What if Nick Sirianni goes 10 and 7, gets to a playoff game, Wins it, gets into a divisional round, and he's one and one. Would the Eagles keep him? Or would the Eagles move on from him? Let me see something here. How many wins does, what's his one loss record right now? What's his law, one loss? I mean, how many? What's his one loss record? In my opinion, if he does that, he's safe. Interesting. Let me see what Nick's one loss record is here. He's 36 and 20. Okay. So if he goes 46 and 27 and four years in a row, He's in the postseason. Does he keep his job? Senor goes, no. Too hard to say. I say if he starts three and seven. Oh. Well, starts the season three and seven, so they won't give him a chance to turn it around then, in your opinion. So you'll you'll accept. Keeping the coach if he goes 10 and 7 and finishes second to the Cowboys in the East. Personally, I happen to think that 10 and 7 might actually win you the East this year because I don't think Dallas, I think Dallas has got some very difficult financial decisions and they're $14 million over the cap. I mean, you know, everyone is saying that the Cowboys, 
and and by the way, I wrote down who do I think is the top teams in the NFC East right now going into 24. I think it's Philly because I think Dallas has a lot more work to do than you. But you'll go like this. Well, wait a minute. Their defense is better than ours. It is. They got a new coordinator, though. And what are you going to do with Zach Martin? And what are you going to do with your quarterback? And what are you going to do with CD? And what are you going to do with Michael Parsons? You've got a lot of money that you don't have. I mean, who are you cutting? Zach Martin? Get this. Guess who's a guess who a um casualty is gonna be this year? Last year was who? Mari Cooper. You know who it's this year? Tony Pollard. Dallas is losing players on a year-to-year basis. They're losing players. Tony Pollard's gone. He's not coming back to Dallas. And you're not restructuring shit for him. You don't have the money to restructure. What who? Dak? You got to get Dak a new deal. Dak's got a $60 million cap hit this year. You got to restructure that. I mean, what do you, I mean, with an extension, you think Dak is just going to restructure that? Not have a contract extension? Absolutely not. So the Cowboys, in my opinion, do they have the better roster on February 15th before the start of the new year? Yes. But after March 13th, they won't. They won't. And that includes, by the way, what, uh, what's the kid? What's the defensive end whose contract is up that you said yesterday, Tone? His deal's up too. His contract is up too. He's 34 and 17 in the regular season. So, okay. Sirianni's 34 and 17. He goes 10 and 7. He's 44 and 24. That's not horrible. Yeah, Lawrence. They're not re-signing him. Cowboys got major issues. Here's what I think. I think. Sirianni has to do this to save his job. I think you could go, t- like like Tone said, I think you can go 10-7 and seven if Hurts is fixed. I think if you go 10-7 and seven and Hurts is just fumbling around, they'll fire him. Nick Sirianni's career is not on his record. Nick Sirianni's career is on what Hurts looks like at the end of 24. Do we agree? This has got nothing to do with what he does. If Jalen Hurts looks better, he takes care of everything. If all of a sudden you see Jalen Hurts and he's balling out and that defense, because there's not enough talent over there, is not getting stops, that's not a Sirianni thing. That's an organizational issue that they have to get better players. And the thing that I told you the most is what? Hey, this is not going to be a one-year fix. So if you happen to do this and you go nine and eight or you go 10 and seven and you miss the playoffs and you don't go to the playoffs, but Hurts throws 30 touchdowns, his picks go down to nine. He looks like a version of 22 and he's a better passer and more fixed it. I think they'll give him a contract extension because that's their ego. We not only fixed Jalen, but we believed in Nick. But if it goes the other way and Jalen fails, Nick's out. Even if you go 10 and 7 and you get to a playoff, they'll fire him and move on and get somebody new in there that could help Jalen Hurts get to where they need to get to. He's out. This does not come down, in my opinion, to the record. I think this thing comes down 
to it comes down to how Hurts looks. I agree. This thing is all about Jalen. The 20, you know, you know those hats that Tone wears and other people wear where it says Hurts season? Oh, this is Hurts season. Let's put it this way. Dallas should just go with Cooper Rush. No way. Cooper Rush is a bum. Um, dude, Deck's not a Deck had a Pro Bowl year. Okay, this has to be the season of Jalen. Let's put this in context. How many people believe AJ Brown's future also hinges on Hertz's success? Do you agree? AJ Brown's future? Do you think it hinges on his success? And I'm talking Hertz's success. I don't care about AJ's success anymore. He's not as important as Hertz's. This comes down to Jalen. If that guy is not better and he still has massive turnovers, once again, what's the point on having him on the team? Here, here's what here's what Tone says. Absolutely, if Hertz has another season like 2023, watch AJ end up on the trading block. Watch this. If AJ has the same year he had and Hertz has the same year he had, like Tone says, they're clearly trading him. And he had a career year. What's the point? I got to pay Devontae. And I got to play Landon. Money is now going to be the issue. And get this, Hertz's contract. You know, you know, you know what's crazy about your boy's contract? Hertz's contract is the least impact over the next two years when it comes to your salary cap. Your corners and your edge rusher are clearly the determining factors. Here's where your money is not being spent wisely. Corner, Edge, and Fletcher. It's not that Fletcher's not a good player. He's not 10 million. He's not 10 million on that Eagle team. Now, is he 10 million in Detroit? Maybe. Is he 10 million in Cleveland or Pittsburgh? Maybe, but not in a football team that has many holes on it. And you, and what's the most important thing? You spent two first rounders at his position to replace. You spent two ones on his position, and you've yet to jettison him off the team. What's the holdup? Well, underperforming. And I'm not talking Jalen Carter. But Jalen Carter kind of came back to the pack. How about this one? Jalen Carter was the NFL Rookie of the Year until he lost it. He lost the award. He was the runaway favorite. I don't think Devin Witherspoon was close. I don't think Will Anderson was close all the way up until week 10. He lost it from week 10 on. That's how bad he fell off the cliff. I don't think it was close. I think it was Jalen Carter and everybody else over here. But as the weeks went on, the yardage kept piling up. Teams kept saying, holy shit, Drew Locke now? Wham. That thing went downhill. His Defensive Rookie of the Year award went fast as that record did. He had it. He had that thing won. Totally did. Jalen Hurts' career this year coming up is bigger than the season that he got the $50 million. Because if he doesn't do it, in my opinion, they'll try to figure a way to get out of the deal. 
You can't have one season of MVP ball and the rest of it be okay. You know, when you make that kind of money, you got a lot of pressure. Hey, man, it's that's not a Philly thing. Arizona is going to be coming up to that decision. Damn. Is Kyler Murray the guy? Look at what you got going on in, in um, Chicago right now. Personally, for me, I don't want Justin Fields in Chicago anymore. He should want out. And you know how he should want out? Don't say nothing. Don't become the bad guy. Let them do it, because you know why? Chicago has a propensity in screwing things up. They'll screw it up and trade him. And then they'll bring in Caleb. If I were him and his people, let Chicago screw it up. Okay? Did you see what Mike Tomlin said, Tone? Tone says, give fields to Tomlin. Do you see what Tomlin said? I have high what, – what, what, what was the comment? On what Tomlin said about him? I wrote it down. Mike Tomlin said something awesome um, about um, – Mike Tomlin, big fan of Justin Fields, okay? That's as close as you can get to tampering. Big fan. And what did Art Rooney say? Art Rooney Jr. has come out and said what? Art Rooney Jr., he came out and he went just like this. Hey, man, we're we're not adverse to not bringing in. I think they're going to swing for the fences here. And personally, I don't think they're going to let Mike Tomlin sit around with crappy quarterbacks like Kenny Pickett, and they're going to give him a quality quarterback because I think they're a quarterback away from contending for an AFC championship. And I will give Mike Tomlin an opportunity. And I think Justin Fields with Mike Tomlin, who's my favorite NFL head coach, he's my favorite. That's the guy I'd want to play for. I got three of my closest friends that are on his coaching staff, go Sills. He is a lot like Jimmy in the way he acts, the way he holds people accountable, how fun it is. Hey, no matter how much money you're making, he don't give it. You know what he tells people inside the locker room? I think you guys would appreciate this. When someone when someone's inside of his locker room where he has a team meeting and he's getting in someone's ass and somebody looks around, and you know what he says to people all the time? Hey, you know the guys upstairs? Those are the people that give a shit more about how much you make. In this room, I don't care. How good are you? Do you produce? Are you doing the right things for our team and our group? It's about the group. Those guys upstairs care how much you make. I don't. See, that's the difference between Mike Tomlin and when you guys try to compare the bookworm and the um, cheerleader to Mike Tomlin, you can't. Because Tomlin runs his house. He's the man of the house. That's Mike Tomlin's room. Okay? We're doing it this way, dude. This is how we do things. This is my house. See, Sirianni, it ain't his house. He's a runner. Okay? Hey, Scott goes, I love when he gets in guys' asses until, until they walk differently after. Hey, Scott, did you see when he was talking to Pouncey? Hey, don't walk away from me. Hey, don't walk away from me. You, hey, you know better than that. You're, hey, it's about the, it's about the team. <laughs> <coughs> hey, man, I'll, I'll give you a story about Roethlisberger. So um, Carl Dunbar, who's the D-line coach, is my, was my teammate. And, you know, he runs the combines. And he runs the D-linemen. He, by the way, he loves Jalen Carter. Oh, man, he loves Jalen Carter. Carl Dunbar loves him. Said Sills, you got to see this kid, man. The Eagles get a shot at drafting him. This was last year. Dunbar works out all the defensive tackles and interior linemen. He's like, this kid's something else. He, he, the year before, when he was talking and he saw Jordan Davis, so he texts me. He texts me a link 
with Davis's 40 yard dash. I hadn't seen it like most of you guys did. And so when he sent that thing, what was it, 478 at like 338 or 341, whatever it was. And he goes like this Have you ever seen anything move that fast? I go, Yeah, wildebeest. I was like, Yeah, wildebeest. Yeah, like a moose, something like that, right? Like a horse or an elephant. That's about as fast as I've seen something, or a giraffe. Okay. He goes, This kid here, man, his box jumps. It was just insane. So he works all these guys out. So anyway, he told me a story about Tomlin. So um, Roethlisberger was late walking into a team meeting. And it was something that was organizational. The, the, the upstairs guys had him doing something. And he walks in late. Mike Tomlin's in the middle of talking. He turns and looks at him. The entire room goes silent. He looks at him. You know what to do. Roethlisberger turned around walked out. Went ahead and continued the meeting and find his ass. I don't care what those dudes want you with. You got a responsibility here. Taking baby pictures, that has no bearing on me. I don't give a shit about baby pictures or you're doing something for the PR department. Those people during football season, I'm the boss. I'm your daddy. <laughs> and brought this burgers like this. Okay, coach, sorry. I'm your daddy. I go, he didn't say that. Yes, he, yes, he did. You heard him in the hallway say it. I'm your daddy. During the football season. I'm your daddy. Yes, sir. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, look, you better win a lot. And he does. Okay. Hey, you better, you better win a lot. And all I say to you is he gets away with it because he's Mike Tomlin. But I, I I told Dunbar, I go, man, Alfredo Roberts, he also, he he got there, I think, three years ago. He played with me at UM. He's a tight ends coach. And Mike is, oh, he told that Kenny Pickett kid, hey, kid, um, yeah, that ain't happening here. It ain't working right now. You need to take the offseason, and you better have a come-to-Jesus conversation with yourself. You show up at OTAs and minicamp, you better do things the right way here. Or guess what? In time in Pittsburgh, that candlelight's running out on you. <laughs> You're telling a first-round pick, hey, your candle's almost out. <laughs> I'm like, what? Shit. At least you know where you stand. You understand? That's all players want. Let me know where I stand. That's all I want. I want to know where I stand with you. You know what I'm saying? I agree, yo. Coaching is an art. Okay? It's not a job. You got to know when to get in a kid's ass. You got to know when not to get into a guy's ass. You got to know when to use the feather or the hammer. But you guess what? This is why Nick is on borrowed time. You know, we go back to the topic. Can he save his coaching career in Philly? I don't think so. You know why? He won't be given the chance to. He just won't be given the chance to. They've taken his ability to fix it away my point would be and that's why i asked tone that question dude they must have a date on the wall for him where they're gonna make a decision how do we look by this date here how do we look by halloween of 24 if we don't look good by 20 by halloween of 24 it's out and then the owner has to make a decision on Howie because once how once Sirianni's fired, Howie's not going to be a protected soul after that. He's going to be scrutinized too. It's going to be trick or treat. I like it. 
That's exactly correct. This thing's either going to be trick or treat. By Halloween of 24, if the Eagles aren't turned around and they're kind of floating at 500, I don't know, man. I don't know how that thing's going to look. I just, I mean, I, re- I, I don't know how that's going to look. Davis needs to said 25 pounds. I think Davis needs an attitude adjustment. I don't know if it's about, about his weight. It's got to be about his attitude. Code red. <laughs> going to run a code red. A Mike Tomlin code red on the Eagles if that thing's not turned around by, by Halloween. I can't think you're wrong. Seriously, I can't think you're wrong. All right. Hey, I appreciate everybody coming aboard today. Thank you guys so much. Um, Really great time for all. Xander, Big Joe, you guys are great. You guys have been great. By the way, Atone, has the content been? I mean, there's this thing never goes away. I mean, the, the Eagles are, I think, again, they're more interesting now than they were during the regular season now. Get more into free agency tomorrow. But, Tone, absolutely great stuff as always. We thank you. Thank you for your contribution all the time. That John McMullen stuff we did yesterday, that was a good listen. By the way, the stuff that we did with Jason Cole today, I really loved our conversation that we had with Jason Cole. Go check it out over at the Jacob Media uh, website. We really appreciate it. Two to six tomorrow, and we shall see you on the flip side. Go for the story and the stories. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Underdog Fantasy has a way.